Go live, go live, please work explicit. Go live, go live, go live. Hello. How are we all doing? Right then, let's see. Security alert, security alert. Now, the reason I'm now playing around my phone quickly is because I'm kind of just been arguing with XSplit, and it's required me to do a whole load of things, which are now flashed up on my phone as security alerts. It's cute. And then you go, right then, yes, 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 you can have access, yes, it was me. Done. Stop being annoying. Stop being annoying. Yes, yes. All sorts of things. I do not know. Anyway, sorry. XSplit was being its usual fun self. Hello, everyone. Hello. How are we all doing? How, how is everyone? This is going to be a fun one. I've already seen some people going, Oh, I wonder if this is going to be included. I wonder if that's going to be included. In the chat I've been watching while trying to get it to go live. And you may not be disappointed. Although I am going to say now, I am not going to get to the Ottomans in Greece. I chucked them on the end, and frankly, I can't be that bothered with them on their dreadnoughts because, honestly, they don't do much. They don't get up to much. Uh, they do a lot of ordering, a lot of thinking, and then uh, they get a German. One of them gets a German battle cruiser, and two of them get two old American pre dreadnoughts. It's not as fun as it is the South American one, or the Spanish one, or the Italian, or the Austro-Hungarian. And the fact there's races going on there, so I'm going to concentrate on those. Hello, Peter Dawson. Hello, Carl McGasberg. Hello, Jamie Peter. Hello, Sarah Thompson. Take care. Thank you. My birthday week is going well. Tomorrow is when I have to actually deal with it. Hello, Henry Milner. Hello, that guy named Dan. Hello, Anuk. Hello, Rick Vosava. Hello, Matthias Slavic. Hello, Ian Carr. Hello, Felix B. Hello, DGB40. Hello, Derp Squad. Hello, Bill Trudit. Hello, Captain Seafort. I don't think you've seen you for a while, Captain. Hope you're well. Um, hello, Calvin Gasberg. Hello, Yickers. Hello, oh, what's Jane Peter? Hmm. How British shipyards coined it? Well, yeah, to an extent. The American ones are quite well as well. Hello, AV Enterprise. Hello, Greg Sarsky. Hello, Ian Carr. How many pre World War and Dreadnoughts ordered by 30 parties were actually delivered as planned? Uh, quite a lot. Hello, Albert Sarsky. Hello, Nordic Wolf. Hello, Jeff Beeler. Hello, Albert Walding. Hello, Albert. I don't think I've seen you in a while. And hello, Robin McFarlane. Hello, made a live on one on time for once. Well, hello, Robin. Welcome. How do you mean? How do you speak? Um. They're all good ideas in the end. They're all very good ideas. He says, dropping his phone after Google has once again plashed another security alert. Ah. Oh. I'm just dealing with them before I go live. I mean, before I, and I said, not before I go live, but before I, um, now to someone watching. Uh, she just sent me a uh, just sent me a picture of her actually and um, clicking on the link for my uh, for my video and watching it. And hello, and an Eric as well. Right then, hello Jess P. Let's see, hello Cahedron. Hello Felix Wing. Nature Sergeant Corps technically belongs here. Nature Sergeant Corps technically belongs anywhere, everywhere. Basically, there's very few people going to argue with HMS Argencore about where she wants to turn up at all. Argencore turned up and said, I want to be here. No one's going to read the argument. Although, there again. 
And more interesting thing is, what would the third, the original ship have been called, or that was called HMS Argentine, been like? That's an interesting question. That is something which causes many, many hours of conversation for me and Drakenfell, but that is for a future topic and a future discussion. Hello, Felix B. So, now I have got this working. We have got the first pass. And now you will notice, hopefully, that there is a column here. And the column goes up. So all the columns have been in now. But I still have these pieces of wood left over because I'm considering columns at the top. And because I chopped them up anyway. Um, you know. Uh, did we give it back in the same condition we got it? No. We gave it back to them, slightly used, and ever so pretty. Hello, Jane Peter. Crossover. There might be a crossover at some point. There might be a full discussion. Right. So. Italy. You, hello, Duffel Pimino. You cannot start a discussion about... Dreadnought without talking about Italy because thanks to a guy called General Vittorio Quinibetti and another one called Rear Admiral Engineering, Eduardo Massadea, Italy almost wins the race for a Dreadnought. Yes, the Dante Alighieri is almost the first Dreadnought. Which gives you a very interesting idea would be now to be calling them Dante star battleships rather than the Dreadnought battleships. If they had beaten the British. Or would it have just been another generation of battleship because it wasn't the British doing it? It's actually a really interesting question to think about. Now, she's a rather pretty little ship. But I have to admit, I'm not that <sighs> enamored with her. Now, my reason for that is, I honestly think if you're going to go to that effort to have all those triple guns on, having it so that she can only fire them <sighs> all at you if you're 45 degrees off the beam, or more, um, so you're basically broadside, or uh, you know, uh, is a bit pointless to me. To me, the whole point would have been actually condense things up, super uh, have them super firing, and have six firing forward and six aft. But these were the Italians designing for Italian waters, and they got themselves a fast ship. 23.8 knots, completed 1912. Length, 500 feet. 19,400 tons, armaments, 12 12-inch guns, 24.7-inch guns, and 14 12-pounders. I especially like the 4.7-inch guns and the way they are arranged in turrets as well as barbettes, because honestly, I think the turrets were the way, definitely the way to go. This is another thing to me of actually superimposing those turrets, because if they'd super fired those trebles, they could have had three, double, three twin 4.7 inches forward and two 4.7 inches aft. But still, that's a cute one. But also, I would like to point out again this name, Eduardo Massadina. Everyone always remembers Cunaberti, and they talk about Cunaberti. He's an artillery general in the freaking army. He's making a big statement about big gun battleships from a mathematical perspective. It's Massadina who actually works out the freaking engineering. It's Massadina. And he gets forgotten completely. Plus, Eduardo Metastea sounds cool in my mind than Vittorio Cunubietti. <sighs> mm -hmm. 
Yeah, because I have your go live song stuck in my head. I try. Go live, go live, please explain work. <laughs> yeah. You should hear the song I sing for the dog when he goes to the, uh, the puppy. Now, we're, we've tra we're training the puppy to go to the loop. And so when he does uh, do the, what he's supposed to do outside rather than inside, which he does not, he does the majority of the time, but pretty much for the whole week he's been fairly good. Um, no accidents, nothing. And considering he had a stomach disease at one, almost at one point, that was quite good. Um, he gets a song. When I bring him in, he's been, he's been good. Uh, you know, it works. It makes the dog feel very happy. But, yeah. Inca, how long could Rio de Janeiro, Rio de Janeiro Agincourt have been and still worked hydrodynamically? <sighs> that is an interesting question we'll deal with when we get to her. Grace Elsie, did they take two pre-dreadnoughts and stick them together? Mm, it does to an extent look like that. It isn't, but that does to an extent look like it. Jeremy I think just Battleship if the Dreadnought is not the first, although maybe still Dreadnought because of the fair dominance of the Royal Navy. Possibly, but yeah. It's an interesting idea. Jeff, yeah, can Birdie design optimized broadside gunnery to spread out most of the same level for optimal broadside gunnery? I agree. But... I think if you're especially designing for the Mediterranean, and you are limiting your head-on gunfire to a quarter of your fire, when you consider a half of the Italian coast is the Adriatic, which is even narrower, Designing everything to depend on being broadside on your opponent, especially in waters which are so good for torpedo attacks. Mm, no. Jim Peter, is it a consideration of machinery? Could you fit the super firing, entire super firing with the funnels there? Well, that's the interesting thing. You'd have to move the funnels. Um, but you could probably do that. Honestly, you could. If you designed it from that way up, we'll go, we'll go, you put the boilers in the position that they could be moved. Um, Shamak, did the triple turret, uh, did the triple, uh, did the triple turrets inspire the Americans? Eh, to an extent, to an extent. Shoot me. Uh, F for headphone users. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I did get a bit louder. I do apologize, Sally. You wouldn't need to reroute the carriers. Instead of thinking, they are building this ship from scratch like this. They are building this ship from the beginning like this. You know, I have a similar problem with the Dreadnought. We will be, get, uh, they will be getting into ships which look like versions of the Dreadnought, and I'll be explaining my problems with them. <laughs> Yikers, glad the sort of popular song too. It's only fair. Um, bitch Pillager. Super firing was slow to be adopted, mainly due to metacentric height, adversely affecting stability. True. Usually does require an increase in beam. But, again, this is the trouble this ship, because of the way its structures are built up anyway, I and it's quite beamy. This is the thing. She is... Oh, let me just get her details from my notes. Dante Alguerre. <sighs> Again, I will never understand why you're naming a battleship for a poet. We'll leave that to one side. Um... <laughs> She has a beam of 26.6 meters. So if you compare that to ships which do have them built up with similar, let's say triple turrets again. Hmm. Honestly, 
she's about three meters too narrow so three meters more beam um uh probably about another 15 meters longer and she could have probably kept the same power same speed and had those superimposed turrets super firing turrets i mean here we go Bad turrets on the same level are easily named Spotfire, optimal broadside gunfire. That is certainly a consideration, but if they've been going for that, then again, they've not got them all on the same level. There are nine turrets on the, uh, there are nine guns and three turrets on the same level. The forward turret is a level higher. So if you're going to go for all on the same level, again, I agree, that's an idea to do it. Then do it, or commit to it. Don't do 75% on one level, 25% on a higher level. Hello, Run Cash. It looks kind of Battlefleet Gothic. It, I would agree on that one. And I know someone's earlier said, uh, was it two pre dreadnoughts bunched together? And there is one which does think that they, and that's a certain idea going on there. Wing turrets are cringe, end of story. Um, we'll get into that. But actually, the wing, the wing turrets in this case are 4.7 inch, so I quite like them. They're the secondary turrets, which makes sense to me. I prefer them to the idea of having those barbettes down the line. I think I'd get rid of the barbettes, definitely. And that's another reason to raise the guns up myself. Zoom the graphic. The famous Italian... The famous Italian poet... Mm. No. Uh, the first famous Italian poet. Okay, maybe, but I, I still do not like naming a battleship after a poet. It seems wrong somehow. One's an artiste about art. One's the epitome of destructive firepower in, uh, you know, persona, well, given form and steel. I, I, I think it's wrong to bring two together. I think it's a, a, a false allegory being made. Um, By correct carbon the half the time coast now genetic. The SMS Verbius unitus preceded the Dante and Legary, but had super firing turrets. True. Hello, Animal 1655. Well, for 16365. Um, Sir Neither naming a battleship for a part, not even the French went to that level and uh, presentious. Nope. Hello, Permanator. Uh, hey, looks like you're Russian journals. They do have some similarities going on. I don't have the Russians included in today's, but that's mainly because there are 24 slides in here to already die. Stromak, I was referring to main battery wing turrets, specifically dreadnought. Agreed. Anjan J, German dreadnoughts with two wing turrets on each side look pretty great. Mm hmm. To an extent, I will accept Dante's Inferno for a battleship, but no. I'd have called it Dante's Inferno then. I wouldn't. I would have named it after the poet, the poem, not the poet. The Inferno. Now that's a good name for a battleship. Well, if you consider pretty much the next uh, there's a class which comes straight afterwards is the Conte de Cavour class. which managed to get super firing turrets on 28 meters of beam. And as I said, the Dante Alighieri is 26.6 .6 meters of beam. So if you're planning for the Mediterranean, you really don't need to worry too much about it. Now, the main difference between these and the Dante is they had 13 rather than 12 12 inch guns yes 13 they managed to squeeze in a whole nother turret and a whole extra gun so 
So if anyone's trying to figure out where in the American psyche the obsession with guns and having more and more of them came from, I would say it's the Italian immigrants to America because of this. It testifies to what's obviously in the Italian psyche. The amount of effort they go to to get in a whole extra gun. Now, what's also interesting is this is about 4,000 tons heavier. And it's also, if you look here carefully at this, uh, the, uh, the, at this thing, at uh, the expanded version of this, the Dante Alighieri is a rotor cable of 23.8 knots. The Conte de Cavour, in original form, is capable of 21 and a half knots. Also, look at how short leg they are. 4,800 nautical miles at 10 knots, etc. You can tell these are Mediterranean ships. These are not designed for ocean crossing. These are not designed to go around the world and show off Italian land and power in the far stretched corners of the globe. <clears throat> They'll basically be out at sea for about five days before they need to refuel, and that means they're coming into port. So, they're Mediterranean hopscotchers. That's what they are. But there's nothing wrong with that if you're Italy. If you want to dominate the Mediterranean, if your biggest annoying thing is pissing off the French to one side of you, and the Austro-Hungarians who used to control part of you on the other side, this is what you need. You don't need something which has huge fuel stocks and huge supplies to go over the world. You need something which has a hell of a lot of armor, speed, and firepower to blast the living daylights out of things. That's what you want. It's no wonder the Italians are pushing for battleships and pushing for all big gun battleships. It makes sense for them. Before anyone else is going to get in, you know, look at the Italians and go, yes, you have limited in in industry. Yes, we do. We want to uh, pare down our logistics as much as possible. So do we want to have about a bazillion gun types in service? No. We want a decent gun type and lots of it. It makes sense. Hello, Frank C Cossack. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to do something which is, might make adjust the noise to make it slightly better and will adjust, allow me to adjust my position to make it slightly better. Oh, hello. Frank. So, Shomak, Inferno is an excellent DD name. No, battleship name, Inferno. If it was HMS Inferno, then it's a destroyer name. But it's the it's the Italian Navy. Inferno sounds cool. HMS Rob Burns, HMS William Shakespeare, HMS Sappho, HMS John Cooper Clark, and HMS Spike Milligan. Maybe not. <laughs> Adrian Abdul from Paradise List is a great name. Yes, but that was. A high speed mine layer. <laughs> Hello, Mother Wolf. Take care. In car, there was a Furnace Works at Mount Nash Wales in the 1980s, which looked just like these early battleships. Mass smoke and flame everywhere. Ooh. Dante fought with the Gif Cavalry at the Battle of Campanino, and he's also regarded as the founder of the Italian language. I agree with all these things, but I also wouldn't want an HMS Chaucer to be a battleship, 
or an HMS Shakespeare to be a battleship. Or a Robert, HMS Burn. Well, HMS Burns to be a battleship might be good. I'm not sure about the Robert bit, but HMS Burns is a battleship. She burns. Could be. Could be a good battleship name. The Cavaliers do have super firing, yes, and their successors do. And it's 13, though, is one of my next problem is, you know, I'd have thought for a good Catholic country, as Italy was definitely at this time, 13 guns might not have been considered the luckiest number to go with. I'm just saying. I thought they would have tried for, I don't know, 18 guns. Or 15 guns. 15 guns, probably. Jim here. I bet the British were happy to sell fuel to any and all national navies during peacetime if they wanted to go further. Very happy for them to have their ships as far away from home as physically possible. And they couldn't get back without fuel from us on the way of our home. Engvolt 42, I see you're rather here. You're enjoying not having to watch your voice in the new office. That is helpful, yes. Ron Cash, I know Italy was relatively industrial and undeveloped, but to what extent was this? Um... At one point, the quote goes that if you put Sheffield into Italy, you would treble their industrial capacity. And that quote was made in 1895, 1896. I'm not sure how accurate that is. It was a British ambassador's report, but... Italy's puts on a lot of development in the next 20 years, in the next mm, decade and a half, and they're still putting on a lot of them when World War I happens, and they're still developing a lot later. They are not, today they're quite an industrial powerhouse in their own right. But they were really building it at this point. Gangazo, re Inferno sounds great. Why USS Megadeth or USS Overkill sound good at rate too? Hmm. Sound a bit on those. Come on, what's your take on the defense review? So far we've had the integra we've had the uh, integrated review. We haven't had a defense review. Defense review is gonna come out next week. So far we've just had the diplomatic survey overview guidance document. Let's see. Yes, Peter. Chaucer, frigate, Shakespeare, and Burns could be frigate names. Though. Yeah, they could be. Again, though, for a battleship, HMS Burns. Yeah, I have supported that one. <laughs> and. They're a good class of ships. I like the Comte de They're sort of... <clears throat> if you think about it, they're built between 1910 and 1915, so they really sort of fought about in 1909. And they build free. And the three they build are Conte de Gaulle, Giulio de Caesar, and Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo is sunk by a magazine explosion on the 2nd of August 1916 and ends up being sold for scrap after the war and not repaired. Which I always think is rather sad. Um, Giulio Caesar. 
or Julius Caesar, is transferred to the Soviet Union in 1949 and sank in 1955 after hitting a mine. And then was salvaged in 1957 and subsequently scrapped. And um, Conte de Cavour, well, of course, she had she was redeveloped and rebuilt and various other things during in, into war years. And then at the Battle of Toronto, she's hit hard. She salvaged in 1941 and scrapped in 1946. They are reconstructed in the interwar years, and pretty much what happens is they lose one of their treble turrets, the central one, and they lose a lot of their 4.7 inch guns. They go down from 18 to um, 12, but this time it's in six twin turrets. Death Gama is upgraded tremendously. Barbettes are upgraded tremendously. The Conte de Gavors are good ships, but they are good ships for 1910. And let's consider what is the Royal Navy building in 1910? Well, it's not Queen Elizabeth class battleships. It's not Iron Dukes. It's not King George V's. It's not Orion's. Really, at this time, we're talking it should be compared to a Colossus class. And if we consider a Colossus class, five twin 12-inch guns. So yeah, they're going to outmatch that. They've got 13 to the 10. RN's one, 6,680 nautical miles at 10 knots. Top speed of 21 knots. Mm. They're doing pretty well. So they have a chance against Glottis and Hercules. But unfortunately, then come the Orions, which are almost then on the top at the same time. And the Orions have 10, 13 and a half inch guns. Sorry, that's your 12 inches out of the way. Come on, the integrated one didn't look pretty, uh, particularly good. It looked okay to me. Not great if you're the army at the moment, but okay if you're navy or air force. It's life at the moment. Yeah. Look, the only people who weren't expecting were expecting more type for uh, more F thirty five orders were people who were expecting who haven't been watching what's been going on with things like the loyal wingman program in Australia, etc. There is too much effort being put into those things for us to sort of go, yes, we're automatically going with F-35s, because we might end up going with a mixed buy of F-35s and loyal wingman. <laughs> and as for ships, well, RN's going to do okay. You've still got to make the case. You can never not make the case. Because I've said it many times. You go to war with what you have. And what you have is whatever the government before you decided was going to be enough. That's got it. They are good for building very fine quality things in very small numbers. Or things that might work sometimes on any given Wednesday in large numbers. Mm -hmm. These are cute as well. Top speed, 23 knots. 16 6 inch guns. I always like some nice 6 inch guns. Uh, 13, 12 inch again. Again, I am. There is part of me which is very surprised about a nation as catholic as italy is in the 1910s building ships which have 13 guns <laughs> mm. 
Carl, it's not, a, don't take this the wrong way on the skills to make videos. I have to admit the first ones were really, really not great. But, set yourself up with a camera and put up, build some slides and then start talking. Uh, remember, uh, McFarlane, I do hit, hit this, I hate to say, but I do seem to remember there was an HMS Shakespeare, not a battleship there. Yeah, that's the point. There was a Shakespeare, not a battleship. Poets actually are quite good things for, I don't know, cruisers to be named for. Because they have a stylish potency and that's beyond their, you know, their particular ballywag. Destroyers as they got bigger. Yeah. Jibiel, it's significant that post World War II, one Italy's major shipyard is the one they get from Austria Hungary. A major choke point in major warship production. It is helpful when they get that one. <laughs> That's got Leonardo da Vinci changed sides in the traditional telling way. From right way up to upside down. Mm. Ian Carr, unlucky to find a mine in 1955. Mm. Oh, hi! Hello, Mally6040. Sorry, Run Cash, they were in dock, and uh, there were, I think, quite a lot of people managed to survive. Uh, they, most of them survived. It was not a fun time for anyone, but uh, quite a lot of the crew managed to get off principally because it was in dock. So they could get, there weren't a, as many people aboard as normally, and B, uh, they could get out and get to safety quite easily. <laughs> Come on, NATO's still finding mines around. In the nicest way, no one has quite any idea how many mines we laid in World War II, let alone World War I. Where they all are. Mainly because everyone was laying mines in World War II and World War I. And when I say everyone, I mean everyone. Make one of so I see a bit of Argent Corps that. You certainly do see a bit of the ideas to go into Argencourt, the idea of, I'm sure we can stick another gun there. Can we? Let's stick some more. Dirt Squad, deck armor is upgraded tremendously by adding some. Um, that took some happens to both these classes, the Andriodora class and the um, Conte de Cavour. I'm walking, and Colossus still use wing turrets. Firepower advantage to Italy. Hmm, probably. Come on, very true, Doctor. Yeah. That's got F 35 orders. Lucky Martin were probably looking at hope for a lot more orders. They were probably, but they've got 45 ordered to be procured by the end of this parliament. And then at the end of this parliament, Britain will have a go and go, right then, so what is the realistic progress of these loyal wingman programs? What is not? And that will be the point at which they'll decide whether they're going to be getting 96 F-35s or 72. Are you ever ordering another 48 or ordering another 24? Because if you're going to be running a program where you've got a load of law wingmen, let's say you've got HMS Queen Elizabeth, right? Theoretically, she has the hangar space for 24 F-35s. I'm never quite sure about that one. Personally, I think you could probably pack in a couple more if you wanted to, but... Okay, let's go with this, the complicated scenario. And... Rated at wartime fighting space, etc. due to the size of the aircraft, you're probably looking at a standard air group of around about 36. Which would be 18 Merlins and 18 F-35s. That's what I'd be thinking, with those Merlins split between anti-submarine warfare, A airborne early warning and commando slash supply. That makes sense. 
But you then go, right then, well, if I've got this space, can I slot in some lower wingman in there or something like that and start supporting some space up there? Well, I can probably bring along another 18, possibly 24 lower wingman because of their capacity of how they can be stored, where they can be stored, the way they can be stored versus you when you're dealing with the manned aircraft. It makes sense to think about that. So, and that's the way Britain's not in the case or in the place where it's working and buying stuff to keep Lockheed Martin happy. And it's doing a role where it's trying to keep Britain safe. Come on, else. Okay, Rumsfeld. Mm, I think Rumsfeld um, was a bit different than my, my personality on these things. Uh, all right. Jim Peter, can we not build our own awesome aircraft? Was Harriet? That makes me sad, Panda. Okay, this is where you've got Tempest coming in, and that would be a lovely long way down the road. The thing is, it takes a long time to develop aircraft. At the moment, there is literally one, two, three aircraft in the production west, which you would call war for modern war fighting aircraft. And there are a lot of upgraded legacy, a couple of upgraded legacy platforms which are still in production. And that's it. That's your production aircraft. So if you're gonna go with an aircraft type that you want to put in your air, on your set on your sh ships or airfields in any time in the next five to ten years, that's your options. Um, yes and yes and. <sighs> Okay, right, so I'm going to say this on the nukes one because it's come up, it's off topic, I do apologize to anyone who wants to carry on battleships and skip nuke stuff, skip ahead three minutes. But on nukes, there is a reason the nuclear number has been put up. We're about to transition to a new type of submarine and a new type of warhead. For both reasons, you need to actually increase your stocks temporarily, at least over the next five to ten years, while you're managing the flow, because you're going to have old warheads, new warheads. You're not going to want to send a ship to sea which has less than a full. Uh, is any sub that goes to sea, any boat that goes to sea, is going to have a full complement that it's carrying of one type of warhead. So all these things mean you are going to have. A, cha a change in the stock numbers. You cannot do it on the number we have. Britain keeps one of the lowest stockpiles of any uh, any nuclear nation. In fact, some say it claim it's the lowest. That means that, unfortunately, when we want to do things like a transition between ships and between classes of ballistic missile submarines, you need to have more numbers. So it's there are lots of people looking at it. And lots of people are saying it's for this reason, that reason. And actually, there's a reason the government isn't making a fuss of it. No one is making a fuss of it in really in, in the leadership of British politics is because they've probably all been told the same thing, which anyone who bothers to pay attention to logistics and systems management at all would tell them it's just a fact of that because you keep the existing stockpile so small, you're going to have to do this. And guess what? In about another 20 years' time, when we're going through another class, they'll probably be doing exactly the same thing. 20 to 30 years' time, another SSBN class coming in, they'll be talking about exactly the same thing. The numbers will be going up again. Right. Back to battleships. I'll dreadnought. Dev Scott, rethink's working on any given Wednesday. I raise you and the Alfa Romeo from the early 90s. Any given Wednesday, that'd be like working in every, any given one Wednesday in a month. Um, Al Welding, could they have made the super firing turrets triples as well? Um, that would require them to be slightly broader beamed. But they could have probably done. Let's take a moment. They're mostly in the ocean and some on the beaches. Yeah. They'll find them at some point. Come on, the Doria class looks suitably American. They do, don't they? Uh, this is the thing you have to again, um, again, as I said. I think I have, looking at these Drenauts from the Italian area, I am more and more convinced the idea that Britain, uh, that 
America gets his love of guns from the Italians, from the Italian immigrants. I, I, I think that is the that is the big example of Italian influence you can see in their culture is their love of guns, lots and lots of guns. Because look at these battleships. <laughs> Man. Um, Dev Squad, the middle turret of the Andrador class looks like it was designed for 360 rotation. Then they put in a mask to stop that. Look, there's there are sometimes people are a bit strange. Okay, they did design it for that, but then they put in spotting to, uh, a second spotting position, and that has to go in front of the funnel. They don't want it to go behind the funnel because then it would be obscured by the smoke. Learn Israel. Um, there is a significant suggestion that we might that UK might be lower than Israel. They, it might UK might be Israel might be lower than us and theoretically should be, but might not be. Jimmy, a good point well made. You're right, of course. The romanticist in me wants the British production, but then when he gets a, a got a job to do, yeah. Also, what the end? Yeah. Come. Uh, okay, that is a fair reason. Yeah, it's the, that's the sad thing about Nicola. Are there also charging missile type new subs? Uh, no, we're not changing missile type. We're changing warheads. We're upgrading to a new warhead on the D5 tridents. Ah, Britain and America are both upgrading warheads at the same time. It's why mm, President Biden has suddenly found that the reason Trump was uh, talking about upgrading the American warheads is because they're both locked into a program where both need to upgrade their warheads at the moment, and we work together, and it cannot be done. If one doesn't do it, then the other one can't do it. And seeing as we're locked into a mutual treaty, we're both having to do it. And to be fair, we both want to. They need to be up designed to deal with a new world. Sadly enough, we'd prefer them there to be used. Adrian JJ, the awards can't even fully arm all that British SSBNs. Nope. No, we don't have enough for that. But also, you must remember, we put dummy warheads on our systems as well as regular warheads. So there are dummies coming in to foil anti-ballistic missile systems. So you have to remember they wouldn't carry a full load of warheads anyway. Sure, <laughs> Also, probably have been told that we won't have to deal with this next time if you just have let her have a few more and then they got laughed at. Mm hmm. Don't I adore the fact that effect she effectively has bound stone chases. Yeah. It's a cute way to use her guns, let's be honest. It is a cute way. She has plenty of six inch guns to go around. Uh, it's kind of like, well, we have eight. And four and eight and four. We have sixteen six inches and fourteen fourteen uh, fourteen fourteen uh, fourteen four pound uh, fourteen fourteen pounders. And you sit there and go, right? Where are the fourteen pounders? And you go, oh, I can count them. There are four there. There are four there. There are four there. I'm still. Oh, the the other four are on top of the gun. Oh, 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 yeah. All right. And there are some fourteen pounder high angles as well chucked in. You sort of go. Okay, you have a lot of guns. You really do. Jeff Hiller, the Italian ships only have one gun less than the Asian Battalion Corps. Yes, they do.
Come, how many six inch guns were on the Doria? There are 16 six inch guns and 14 14 uh, and pounders. Uh, six 14 pounder high angles and all sorts of other things as well. Champion. Anyone else like how in the old days the way the sub captains would know to crack the prime minister's letter was if they couldn't pick up the world service? That makes me worry. Some Zach. Hello. So, if Italians love guns so much, why do you build the Regia Elena class with only two of them? Don't get me started on the Regia Elena class, okay? <laughs> There are some interesting decisions made at the various points. Uh, that's good. I wouldn't like to be the spot on top of the Maria Mars in a battle if the turret had to turn 270 degrees quickly. It might consider an acceptable sacrifice. Yeah, but that also might bend one of its turrets, so they might decide not to do that. How the heck is, how does the ammo get up to the guns on top of the turret? Good question asking that one. So, they had ladders on the back of them. And someone had to carry that. Basically, you were climbing up a ladder while the turn, and theoretically, let's hope, of course, it was in some sort of scenario where you're under air attack, so those guns weren't moving, because I'm presuming they are the high angle ones. The 14 pound the high angles, I'd presume they wouldn't be, they, that wouldn't matter having those above those turrets. Um, I'd hope anyway. And, and Nickers, and I'm guessing these gun turret stations would have to be cleared when main gun turrets are firing? You'd hope so. Otherwise, you're going to lose some crew very quickly. <laughs> Lots of people hated their jobs on battleships. Actually, I think... Um... Most of the people who are doing the gunnery outside probably didn't mind it as much as the people who were uh, jobs were to um, coal the ship. That would have been far more uh, mus um, bad for your health, basically. Dev Squad, in Italian, you've got to till we cut through the Mars to get down. <laughs> ah, you'd watch me get down off that Mars very quickly. I don't know, shell rock sucks for ammo supply? No carrying cases. <sighs> Where were these battleships built? Constance. Well, they're Italian, but where are they built? The Andra Doria class are built in uh, La Spezia. Arsenale and okay right so this is in Naples but I'm going to try and pronounce it okay Reggio Cantimere and Cantiere di Casala Casalemere di Stabia Casalemere di Stabia of Naples and that's where Caedulio is built um they're a cute class and I didn't include the plan class because the plan class are even more interesting. Uh, the plan class that come off these are the Francesco Caratoni class. And they were to carry eight 50 inch guns in twin mounts, 12 six inch guns in single mounts, eight four inch guns in single mounts, 
12 single 41.6 inch guns in single mount and eight 21 inch torpedo tubes and one of them was actually launched the uh, francisco caracone was launched from the casamere casamere de stabia uh, the royal navy are there in the 12th may 1920 and she of course was cancelled because of treaty it's terrible the 34,000 tons and they look so pretty oh that's a very lovely looking hull so it could have been interesting i don't know How are they? How guns on top side, turret top supplied ammo? As I was explaining earlier, they actually had little ladders on the back. Sometimes they carried up. How lucky. But the bridge here looks like. I mean, there's. Like, couldn't they ask Brits how to design a proper bridge? Eh, don't get me started on this bridge. Michael Turret, what is the difference between these and the Cavos? Well, the main difference between them and the Cavos. Is more armor, and broadly speaking, twenty-three knots of speed versus uh, twenty-one and a half knots of speed versus twenty-three knots of speed again. Still, though, the fastest one we talked about so far was the Dante Alighieri. When did the Italian smoke go metric? About halfway through this. Which is why it's so interesting. 41 6 inch, uh, no, um, four 1.6 inch guns, mainly. Better tell him nice, so well done. Thank you. It's <laughs> difficult to make sure I get it right. I've been practicing. No need to be rude about Les Bezier. I'm not being rude. It's easier to pronounce. Come on, and I really don't want to be near that thing's replacement and destroyer. Hmm. No. That's good. That's good. Carl Gassman says that on the Austro Hungarian ships, the guns on top of the turrets were manned by the crew of the turret. Was that same true in the other navies? In some, in others, not. Um, in the Royal Navy, they usually had their own light gun crew. But it would, could well be that if they were in a scenario where the main guns weren't being manned, weren't having their crew in them, and they were under attack, those crew would then be supporting them. It gets iffy at various points. Basically, the whole point is if you're under attack and your guns are need to be firing, you fire the guns, whether you're trained on them or not. That's why there's that scene in Pearl Harbor, the movie, where um, what's that? Cuba Gooding Jr. jumps on a machine, is a, is a cook, but jumps on a gun and starts firing at the attacking aircraft is very very accurate because at that point when you're under that much attack and you need people firing back and you don't really care about their skin color rank role job whatever you just want bullets in the air everything else is secondary One point six inches, roughly forty millimeter. E.
No, don't, don't call him. Apologies, Clark. I had that shot team. Shame, I'll miss the Austrians. It's a shame as Hasburger, if that's even thing. What's really strange is, it's actually... These are the future things come out, but... And currently, the vote for the patrons is live right now. The next ones are Spain, and the ones after that are Austria-Hungary. So, you managed to get back in a bit, you probably get to see them. Don't care, Tom, though. Uh, come, uh, come see what were the caracados built in uh, one piece, or did they have to do a cut and shut job like the French and Dunkirk's given their length? No, they were building in one piece. And that's probably that cook was breaking very much breaking every regulation it says by getting on that gun. I know, but <laughs> that's the point in the nicest way. No one's really going to be complaining. In fact, if probably if anyone had seen anyone complaining about the regulations at that point, that person would have been handed the gun and told to start firing. That's gone. If I remember correctly, the black cook who took over the Aegon machine gun was initially threatened with court martial and the story got to Washington. I think there was one or two officers who tried to do it, but I seem to remember the captain of the ship or the senior surviving officer of the ship was very much quashing that, as was Nimi as was every admiral in the vicinity who had half a brain. And when it got to Washington, the officers uh, who were pushing it found themselves even quicker out of the service than the officers who hadn't who, who had been in charge at pearl harbor um I, I i seem to remember there was a sort of thing of this is a ready-made hero we can rally the troops around what in the name of all things are you talking about <laughs> So now we are going to talk about the smallest battleship, uh, smallest dreadnought battleships ever built. And here is my theory on these. I think it's because of these ships that they decide on the 10,000 ton limit for cruisers. Now hear me out. Because there had been a point made by several people that if you make the limit for, uh, for cruisers, because originally they were going to make the limit for cruisers, no cruiser could displace more than half a battleship. Okay? So if you make the limit for a battleship 35,000 tons, you therefore have a de facto limit for a cruiser of 17,500 tons. Well, that could make things very interesting for a Spaniard. Most there are plenty of complaints, just mostly afterwards, and he doesn't deserve any awards until that was overruled by the president. Yes, pretty much the complaints came after the firing was over, mostly by people who hadn't been doing much firing themselves. Um, yeah. Avian Bros, regulation, who gives a flip? <laughs> yeah, as I said. Hi, Trent. <laughs> That's good. Uh, a ready-made hero that we can rally the... Mm, yes. Uh, African-American troops around, especially are important given the civil rights situation in the US at the time. Yes. Hmm. Promptly stuck on a CV as a cook, sent out and back out, and never heard from again when it was quite, sunk quite soon after. That's sad. <laughs> oh, it was coming in the segregated DS Navy that one or more of the gun crews on a ship with coloured mess attendants. Hmm. Britain and Spain should have started building high-speed rail sooner than building baby dreadnoughts. Or maybe destroyers. More destroyers. Let, let's be honest, they're building these long before high-speed rail existed. After, honestly, and this is the one. 
These are built because of the Americans. You destroyed their fleet. Okay? America? This class is on you. And everything that happens to them is on you. How was that see? 17,500 ton cruiser. Typical Japanese in World War II. Uh, in my experience of people in the for uh, people in the forces or connected forces, is the people most keen to make sure to stop our people getting awards, medals, or recognition tend to be the people who've done the least themselves and are so worried about being outshone. And I would say that apply that isn't just in terms of race i'd say that sometimes applies in terms of everything that they can come up with as a reason to justify their actions but basically it's all down to pettiness and ego and upset that they weren't given the opportunity because you know if i'd been in that situation i'd have done so much better yeah right No, that's a point. The US Navy had decided to use him uh, to ensure they get four times forward carriers by naming the fourth after him, though. I know, as we have commented on Bill Trump several times, that is the US Navy learning from the Royal Navy's playbook. You make a name which they cannot cancel. <laughs> Are you really going to cancel the Doris Miller, Miller Mr. President? No. <laughs> I am the Chief of Naval Operations. I have outwitted you once more. <laughs> so, now we are going to talk about the littlest battleships, the Espana class. And for starters, they have wing turrets of a form that can fire cross deck. So, theoretically, here's the thing. They could theoretically fire six forward or six aft. They're all on the same level, which gives them that great fire control you were talking about earlier for the Italians. But these are really all on the same level. Um, they have a single engine. As baby battleships go, they're pretty darn good. The only thing I'd like to do is... <sighs> Honestly, I don't like wing turrets. And I don't like cross-decking turrets. I'd like them centerline, and I'd like them fore and aft. But it does have the option, as I said, you could fire six forward out of eight. So you could present your bow to the enemy and still be pummeling them with 75% of your firepower. Well, uh, Wildling, this Baltimore's had 17,000 tons. Hmm. Yeah, Dr. Miller helped several sailors who were wounded, including the captain of the ship, and while manning anything for gun, for which he, he had no training, he shot down Japanese planes. Yes, and I seem to remember it was the captain of the ship who basically threatened to do some nasty things and managed to get the messages to Washington quickly. Um, if they did anything nasty about him. Could you consider the Spanish little battleship the original supercruiser? No, it is a battleship, but it's a cute one. <laughs> yes, Derp Squad, a lot of people did try to distract from mess at Pearl Harbor by um, making a lot of noise about anything else they could come up with to make a noise about. When is a battleship a monitor? When it has a much shallower draft and a lot less guns than this thing does. That was actually, oh my god, did those ships look as bad as this? Yes. Um... <laughs> oh, here you go. <laughs> so. Now to make these super size so you can see them. This is the Espana as built in 1913. Espana herself 
uh, manages to get sunk after firing at some rifts. So yeah, she gets into trouble. And then you have Jamie I, uh, Jamie the first, who is named after the one of the first kings of Spain, and he's the only one who actually keeps his name the whole way through. You can see that they have their boats mounted on top of their turrets. Yes, they really did have their boats mounted upon their t atop their turrets. Um, you can see how they looked in 1913 versus 1937. Uh, and you can see how short they were, 140 meters. They are very, very dinky. <clears throat> Javila, could the Spanish ships have been built with super firing turrets? Yes, these ones could have been. Considering what they were aiming to achieve, they could have probably built them with super firing turrets. They need to make them a little bit beamier and possibly a little bit longer, but not much and not much either way. They are built with British assistance. Um, the Spanish are not outclassed any pre not. Yes, it does. Vision, they're cute in the Victoria Liberty. Who are these ships supposed to fight and win against? Um, probably the uh, the Americans if they tried to take any more of their uh, colonial possessions, or they'd already taken pretty much everything. Um, the French potentially, uh, the Ottomans maybe. The Italians, possibly. Honestly, the Spanish are building them because they want to build a battleship and because they just had their navy wiped out and they need to look, they want to feel big about themselves again. It's kind of the na nation state equivalent of going and buying yourself a Jaguar after your hair turns grey. <sighs> Cajun, how long did those boats survive when the ship was firing? Don't ask that question. I, uh, I don't think it sunk after shooting the Moroccans. Um, she hit the seabed, basically. Um, she was found herself in a very shallow part of the Mediterranean, and it destroyed her. The Portuguese, yes, they were built to fight the Portuguese, but honestly, the Portuguese basically rely on the Royal Navy being their allies. And don't take this the wrong way, but they ain't taking out the Royal Navy's equivalents at this time. And here you go. Here is Alfonso XIII, who of course is rebelled against, overthrown, and the Second Spanish Republic is declared. At which point then, as Espana has sunk, she becomes the new Espana. Yeah, yeah, Espana. Ba 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 ba. Anyway, so their normal displacement: fifteen thousand tons, seven hundred. Uh, fifteen thousand seven hundred tons. Their full load: sixteen thousand four hundred fifty tons. See what I mean? If you give them the Royal Navy 17,000 tons, 17,500 tons, imagine the 8 inch cruiser they could have built. Think about the counties, but the RN having 7,500 more tons to play with. Okay? Think about that. Am I the only one who's thinking 12 8 inch guns in four triple mounts? Yeah. 
Imagine what the town class would look like if they'd had 17 and a half thousand tons to play with for the towns. <laughs> How many six inch guns can we fit on you? <laughs> So I, I can understand the framers of the treaties limiting it to 10,000 tons, but this is, this, uh, this is something I think about. Trent Lanka, they're really big Jaguars. Well, they kind of lost their whole navy to the Americans. That's good. I imagine these were also built to be able to um, threaten a colonial governor that is pondering independence. Yeah, to an extent, yes. Hello, Andrew Gamble. Hope Robbie went well. Chirpila. Peru and Chile before the latter arrives. <laughs> no, these are not threatening any of the South Americans. They're just not. Trend, that's Scott. When you're that entire navy, your midlife crisis is a bit bigger. Yeah. Vision. Space battleships were useless uh, then for defense against other powers with bigger and more battleships. Spend money on trains and school books or destroyers and subs. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Michael Drott, the evil laughing is breaking my audio. I do apologize. And let's imagine Japan and Italy cheating by 20% over 17,500 ton limits. <laughs> they are the babby dreadnoughts they are babbies um they've got 12 yarrow boilers supplying four steam turbines that generated 15,500 shaft horsepower they had a top speed of 19 and a half knots and a range of 5,000 nautical miles at 10 knots. They're armed with eight 12 inch guns, 24 inch guns, four three pounder guns. <laughs> um, and we, the belt armor, let's be honest, it's eight inches thick of belt armor. Decks, one and a half inches. Turrets are eight inches. Conning tower is 10 inches thick. Which again, I don't understand. You're making the conning tower 10 inches thick armor. Great. You're going to keep the people in charge alive a little bit longer, but everyone else is going to get blasted those smithereens. Inca, imagine that manic laughter being listened to by pedestrians passing the office. It is fun. I do wonder about people on the other side of that wall and how they feel. Shomak, think about all the water-based armor you could hide in 17,000 tons of cruiser. Oh, yes. <laughs> Abelaski, hmm, 17,000 ton county, treble turrets, 18-inch armor belt, 35 knot speed, plane hangover catapult around the world range. I'd take that. Yeah, the, there are all sorts of options the Royal Navy managed, though. Coastal defense ships, potentially. Uh, these are very much baby battleships. They are battleships, they can call them a dreadnought, but everyone when they see them goes, Oh, isn't it cute? I want to tickle it under the chin. Isn't it pretty? Um, they end up fighting in the Civil War. Neither survives the Civil War that's to the left. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's fun. And... Yeah, the, the, uh, Darius Rodowski, little pro literally pocket battleship. Yes, if we're going to start talking about ship being a pocket battleship, this is what it's got to compare to.
I can't. I also wonder if they had a tr uh, set the treaty limit at 12 inch and no longer than, than the Spaniard. That would have made a very interesting cru uh, cruiser, but at that point, the cruisers would have been very much small battleships when you consider most battleships had 14 inch guns at the time. So that's why the cruiser gun limit is set at 8 inches. It literally is because we go too high, they are pretty much battleships anyway. <laughs> Coming up, re-17,000 ton county in peacetime, in war. RN somehow finds some armor laying around and slot in and 20,000 tons? Possibly. So 30,000 ton hipper class cruisers, if they're building a 30,000 ton hipper class cruiser, then at that point they are probably building another battleship. That's what you're building at 30,000 tons. You're building basically a battleship. You see, this is the thing. Actually, um, this will sound strange, but it's easier to hide on the smaller ships than it is on the larger ships. So if your range is up to 17,500 tons, there also becomes a point to which, is it worthwhile you lying, you hiding it? Ron Cash, love to see these going toe to toe with some of the Black Sea Fleet. It would have been interesting. Alaska class cruiser. If it was an Alaska class cruiser versus this, I would take the Alaska. I really would. I guess the good thing about the ship is it forces the other navy to bring a battleship to the uh, to the fight. Yes. Ah, uh, that's the point. I would argue these are the Terence battleships. Sorry, 23,000 ton Hippoglass. That would be more viable. Still be big enough to be visible, really. In car, these ships are likely to lie rather deep in water. Well, as you can see, uh, this one's doing okay in the water. And if you go back to the plans, you realize why. They have quite a lot down there. They really do. There is a reason they have a draft of 7.8 meters for their size. A beam of 24 meters and a length of 140. <laughs> to be fair, the two Espanias versus one Alaska, I'd still take the Alaska. Um, in Espania versus Michigan, Ooh, depends. Pre-World War II, Michigan? Daylight? Good crew? Well, yeah, maybe the Espana, but honestly, I prefer to be on a boat closer to the Michigan. Um, Paul Johnson, why use 8-inch guns and not the 9.2 in an uh, in orange canning house? Um, well, you could have used the 9.2, but honestly, 9.2 is a good one to go with, if you can, if you're allowed by, by treaty. Shromack, similar theory to 1047s? Project 1 yeah, similar. Yeah. Espanas versus Michigan, not Alaska. Jeez, you guys. Yeah. It's, a, it's a tough to call. Um, it's sort of, yeah. They must have rolled. Well, uh, Adam, I feel these ships were more designed for the Mediterranean than the Atlantic. So, honestly, I wouldn't have liked to have fired a broadside on them, though. So, what have we got coming up? Uh. We've got more sci-fi on Sunday. We've got Patron 20, Sign the Japanese War of 1894. On 25th of March. 26th of March, we have Armchair Admirals, the Battle of Matapan. 28th of March, we have Brew Ships 43, Aircraft Carriers and Naval Aviation. And...
That's a lot of saluting guns being fired if that's a saluting gun. Hello. I think a fluff ball's appeared outside my window. Hello. Coming in. Hello. Did you get out from your sleep? Fluff ball, sorry. Right then. Fluff ball. Now, this is the thing. All those who have dogs know there is one thing to always keep around. Hey? Something to block a door. And B. Out there, Papa Dog. Yes, I've got biscuits. Ronnie. Come, I'll be come. Come on. I don't know. Ronnie. Biscuits down there. We'll see if he dances in the door. He's currently running around having fun. And let's see. No, he won't come. She keeps it. She keep My sister's out there flapping her hands. We all know that doesn't work with dogs. Ow. I've got um, Titan Minotaur and Titan Class Cruisers, then the Battle of Saints on the 9th April. And strategy and something medieval are the two sets of brew ships I've got 44 and 45 on them. And I said, patrons are currently live now for discussions. And there's going to be dreadnoughts around the world as a long patrol on 20th of April. Where I'm going to take this and other, pre uh, other slides that I did, I've got uh, worked out and turn in on a whole lot of dreadnoughts 1905 to 1914. Right. And it's not, uh, that's not saluting guns being fired. So if it is, it's multiple saluting guns, considering that's about three different puffs of white smoke. Well, it is Brew Ships 42, Trent. Um, so it seemed inappropriate to be sci-fi. Has Jamie agreed to be here? Jamie has agreed, but he's still not sure about the timings. Inca, why for gun diameter did RN use decimals of inch rather than fractions? Well, doggy's been got out. I will now close my door. The fluffy research assistant has managed to cut his paw, so he's not supposed to be walking or going anywhere near muddy at the moment, which is why he's not come down here. not supposed to be out running around, but he keeps making breaks for it every time my sister's on duty. Ah, I love her dearly, but um, the dog's a bit fast for her. And the... Corgi's even faster. <laughs> um, the Battle of Saints. Not Saints, the Battle of Saints. <laughs> oh. It's a good time. Why do they use decimals of inch rather than fractions? Um, because 13 and a half sounds so much better than mm, 13 and a half when you're writing it's 13.5. Um, because the RM was trying to decimalize slowly because they did realize that actually decimalizing made things easier. Despite the fact that inches technically, yeah, are fun. <laughs> 
Do you ever hear that typewriters mean decimal inches rather than the fractions? That is also a case. Typewriters, it is easier. But to be honest, the Royal Navy doesn't really care that much about those typing staff. Let's be honest, they do call them writers. <laughs> That's good. I pity. I think having a the few uh, ha uh, having a few ships of line or dreadnoughts up at the sta at Staines would be interesting. It would be, but it was the Battle of the Saints, and it literally happened on that day. So I thought it was nice to do it now. All right. So Austria Hungary. Now Carl ha will be very happy about this because I'm starting off with the Radetzky class. Now why am I starting off the Radetzky class? Because they're a semi-dreadnought, okay? There are pre-dreadnoughts, semi-dreadnoughts, dreadnoughts, super-dreadnoughts, and there's HMS Warspite. But we'll leave that to one side. So, uh, Bidrum. It is uh, middle power are better off building battle cruisers than destroying also that destroy all smaller ships than a BB while being able to run away from BBs. Would Spain and Brave be better Spain and Brave? Brazil? Be better off with free battle cruisers and free battleships. <sighs> It depends what you want them for, okay? If you want them to form an offensive function and to try and draw your enemy away from you, then you want the battle cruisers. However, if you have a large coastline and your enemy outnumbers you, or you are going to have to fight through your enemy to get to the sea, then battleships are your only option because you are not going to be able to avoid battle. That's the real problem with Graben for the um, Ottomans when they get up. She's a battle cruiser. That's great. Lovely. We've got a battle cruiser. Where can we go? Well, there's a whole pack of dreadnought, uh, pre dreadnoughts of the Royal Navy sitting out there. Oh, golly gook. And by the time there aren't such a huge pack of pre not sitting out there, she really can't go that far. And when she does go out, she hits a mine. It just, yeah. Battle cruisers are fine for certain navies to invest small portions of their capital ship assets into. They're not really good for all or nothings. And this is one of the things of, you talk about the Dutch. The Dutch talk about putting battle cruisers into the their Southeast Asian holdings, the Philippines. Well, that's a great idea. Yes, have a battle cruiser. But the trouble is that's going to ensure those battle cruisers aren't going to be able to run away when the Japanese battleships show up. And your whole thing is that they're supposed to cause enough damage and require enough force that you, may, you become an unappetizing meal. That isn't going to work. You need battleships for that. You need to be able to take a few pounds because you are going to get pounded. You are going to get sunk in that scenario. Your only option is to cause damage, is to fight them. That means you can't run away from them. You have to engage. And if you have to fight and have to engage, then having a higher speed and the ability to run away doesn't help. What you need is armor. If you can't maneuver, you need armor. So, Rodetsky class. Are Rodetsky's good for a march? Mm, possibly. I did enjoy playing that on my trombone. Um, that's what you get when everyone else is building dreadnoughts. And your designer, Siegfried Popper, keeps trying to get you to build a dreadnought, but you don't have dog docks big enough. So you build these. Aren't they pretty? 
I actually like these ships. I think they actually make a very good sort of idea for the realities of the Austro-Hungarian position. And there's actually part of me which is thinks that the Austro-Hungarians would have been better pumping out these than building dreadnoughts because fighting in the confined waters of the Adriatic, these to me make more sense in some ways because they've got guns which can take on cruisers efficiently, guns which can take on destroyers efficiently, and guns which can take on battleships efficiently. And considering you're fighting the Italians who can fire three forward, well, you can still fire two forward. In fact, you can get six forward if you count in your nine point your secondary armament, which is um, your 9.4 inch guns. Um... Hmm. Well, yeah, they could have had an all 9.4 inch gun armament and gone for 12 9.4s, but they went for four 12 inch in two twin mounts and then the 9.4s. It's perfectly standard. Um, battle crew, uh, Jeff Wheeler, battle crews are more expensive operator build and operating battleships. Yeah. <sighs> Mm, build, possibly, depending how you're building them and what you're building them for. Operate, not really. They're usually about the same crew size. Yes, they require more fuel if they're going at higher speed the whole time, but they don't sail everywhere at 28 knots. So, not really. Um, That's what... I'd say the SC was a dreadnought. All big gun armament with a reasonable, if not atrium dreadnought speed. And armament to resist their own guns. Yeah, I would say South Carolina is heading towards a dreadnought starship, yes. Yeah, potentially, Darius Aransi. Potentially you can turn this into a cheat ship, but you know. Gerben can operate in the Black Sea. Well, that's great. She can operate in the Black Sea. Does the Royal Navy care about her operating in the Black Sea? I know that's going to annoy the Russians, but then Gerben in the Black Sea keeps her running into the Russian Navy, and the Russian Navy keep beating her. She spends most of her life running away from the Russian Navy in the Black Sea. Yes, they can't catch her, but that's not really the point. Hello, John Shea. Hello, Dr. Arnold. Sorry, sort of late. And just saying hello and saying good night early, uh, since I'm working around. Don't worry, I'll watch live later. Take care. Thank you. <laughs> Wayne Baron, wish I could stick around. A request. How about a long patrol on coastal defense ships? That probably will be coming at some point. Thank you, Wayne. Take care. Um. Surprising the Skoda 9.4s were weaker than the British 9.2. Well, to be honest, it is a Skoda. Uh, you know. They're nice enough, but they're always slightly on the weak side. I know this because, well, I drive a Subaru and regularly I have Skodas trying to overtake me and failing. And I'm doing the speed limit. On the road I'm actually on, not the national speed limit on the road I'm not supposed to be on, doing it on. Um, and the spell slash to a two slimmer to the 12 inches. That would confuse things. I was asking, could Radetzky's be real gem star below an inch? Not really. Not with the turret rings they had. 
Jeff Healer. Battle cruisers have an economic cruising speed compared to a reciprocating battleship. Um, to be honest, they can do actually. That's one of the interesting things about battle cruisers is they often have two cruise speeds. They have a super cruise and a cruise speed, so they often do have an economic cruising speed. Well, they can be cruising long, and they can shut down. And they shut down a lot of boilers. It's one of the things again because they have a length to beam ratio, and their length they are longer to a narrower beam to an therefore proportionally narrower beam. They can sometimes often be more economical in running. Dev Scott, yes, pretty much, but I'm not going to read that. Palm out to ignore, uh, to what I know, my German listeners. <clears throat> Rowan Cash, what was the German, uh, what was the Austro Hungarian industrial capacity like, or did they outsource their builds? It was quite good. The main debate that you have in Austro Hungary about this is where it should be built in terms of, you know, should it be built in Austria or Hungary? And which which places would build them? Um, in the case of the Tegenhof class, uh, various units of Tegenhof and Prince Ubum were all built at Stabletto Tecnico Triesto Triest, which was of course taken over by Italy after World War One. And the Sven Istvan was built in Fiume at Ganes Dabius, the Gans works. Now, if you're going to ask me why have I chosen the picture I have as the background for the Teganov class, well, that's because there's two of them in here. A surviving two from World War I. Now, um, that's Tegenhoff and Prince Jürgen. Vidris Unisus was um, sunk by Italian frogman on the 1st of November 1918 after she'd been transferred to the state of Slovenes, Croats, and Serbs. And St. Istvan, of course, the youngest of the four, of the four was um, sunk by Italian torpedo boat on the 10th of June 1918. They're cute ships. They are nice. Uh, again, you have all sorts of issues going on getting them produced, but they're twenty-one, nearly well, twenty-one thousand six hundred eighty-nine tons, or twenty-one thousand seven hundred tons, make near enough makes no difference. Full load, one hundred fifty-two meters long, uh, twenty-seven point nine meters wide, so pretty much twenty-eight meters. Draft eight point seven meters. And between 26,400 and 27,000 shaft horsepower, which pretty much allows them to get to a speed of up to 20 knots. Now, I please note I am saying up to 20 knots. I'm not saying 20 knots. There is a reason I'm saying up to 20 knots. Because they very rarely get up to 20 knots. In fact, getting a Tekken half class to 20 knots, it counts as an achievement. It really does. There are some parts in these things, especially engines, which are imported from the British. Um, but, you know. There you go. It gets what works. Jebula, Italy gets both shipyards after World War I. Um, did I? Let me try and remember. Oh, they do. They do get both shipyards only. Because they get that bit. Hmm. Uh. Hang on. Oh, yeah, they do. It's right at the north, isn't it, of Croatia?
They don't really get it after World War One. They get it after after World War One. There's first of all there is the Free State of Fume, formed in 1920 to 1924, and then eventually Italian nationalists managed to push out the crowd population and take over. So yeah, they do get it in the interwar period, but they don't get Fume after World War One. And the trouble is when they lose quite a lot of the work yards. Jeff, um, okay, sure reminds me of the of oh, Great Britain keeping Scotland happy with building projects in the docks. Mm. That's gone. That and EMI Films would probably use a bot to claim the entire live stream for copyright violation. Um, mm. Well, the Tegenhoffs do have four treble turrets, but they are super firing. Just gone. Oh, I thought the Tegen Hoffs. Um, I think you're thinking of one of the Italians, Dope Squad. Dope Squad, uh, uh, 20 knots when going down a steep hill, 20 knots when they got the wind behind them. Going down the earth. Um, in car, does Italy build warships at Trieste for World War II? They build warships pretty much everywhere for World War II. Uh, Dope Squad, uh, I know the Gangut class was like that. The Gangut class are, if we go back for earlier ships. There you go. The Gangut class are more about the Italians school than they are about the Austro-Hungarian school. So this is where the Gangut class come from, the Dante Alighieri. Not them, uh, nothing from them. And, um, well, we then have these. The planned Erzat Monarch class, which are rather cool. So they don't have 12 inch guns, they have 14 inch guns. And they were supposed to have 15 Yarrow Star boilers supplied, but they, of course, didn't have Yarrow Star supplying them anymore after, you know, um, you declared war on Britain, so you weren't getting those supplies. It's terrible. You know, I can't think why Britain doesn't honor a contract under those circumstances in the middle of a war, but you know, they don't. And... These are really, really quite special ships. And I have to say, this plan was sent to me by Drac because I couldn't find a decent plan of them. And so he found this one somewhere. <laughs> and this shows you how big the Tegnos could have been built because the Erzat Monarch class take full advantage of the facilities offered, especially in the other in the Fiume yard and it would have been an interesting thing to have built as you can see these are more heavily armed and faster 21 knots slightly longer range they were still deciding between five or six torpedo tubes they had a fairly good belt picked out for them a fairly good armor yeah and they would have been approximately 20 meters longer 20 25 meters longer than the Teganovs.
Dirk Scott, the Russians hired a lot of Italian expertise in the pre-war and into war eras, right? Also licensed a lot of Italian technology. Yep, they did. A lot of Italian technology. Oh. Ten 14 inch guns. So that's why they've lost two guns compared to their predecessors, but their predecessors were 12 inch. These are 14 inch. So, you know. It works out. It does work out. For the Adriatic, these would definitely have been some beasts of ships to try and fight. If you consider if you were a destroyer coming up them, you've got that citadel style system with the barbettes. So you're likely to find yourself facing, well, if you come at them from any direction, uh, the minimum you'll be facing is three 5.9 inch guns. You'll probably find yourself facing anywhere up to seven 5.9 inch guns and then you're going to have a lot of three and a half inch guns and a lot of 1.9 inch guns blasting away if you're an aircraft attacking how's that seem? they look somewhat fat behind the bomb version yes but the thing is they are fatter but they're also a lot longer which actually gives them a more efficient hull form and allows them to be more developed their firepower. <laughs> oh, we got one. Uh, that monarch means monarch class replacement. Yep. <laughs> now. There is a reason I've listed them as Urzat Monarch rather than Monarch Class Replacement or the various other options you can get from them because actually I have a feeling they would have used the Monarch names because that's what they were planning. They're planning on replacing the Monarch Class sort of battleships and their first pre-Dreadnought battleship with these Monarch Class. And I have a feeling they would have reused at least some of the names. So this is why I've gone with Urzat Monarch Class as the name for them. Uh, 1,000 officers and crew. Sorry, I forgot to type in the and crew. Derp squad. Jay Buff, Clarky, you need a better chair. Eh, Jay. It's okay, chair. It only creaks on occasion. Certainly cable taking on any contemporary Italian designs. That was the plan. I think I read somewhere that the Erzat Monarch class would have been in F 35 centimeter guns would have been interchangeable with the Mac end. Is that correct? I, I've read that as well, but I'm not really sure about the sourcing of that. I don't probably, but possibly not. Damn it, sir. 38 officers, 16 NCOs, uh, 1,106 men. I would hope they'd have more NCOs than that. Otherwise, the NCOs are going to be incredibly powerful. 16 senior NCOs, maybe. Um, that's good. I figured that was the case for you to crew, but I decided to go for the cheap laugh. Oh, don't worry. It happens. Besides, this chair was bought for me by my mum when I was about 
14. Served me well enough for a fair number of years. Served me for a bit longer. I've replaced the wheels. I've changed the mechanism, which makes allows me to ride up and down because that ran out and broke for some reason. Teenager using it for those years managed to use up all the give in the system. And um, yeah, it's a good chair. Thanks, sir. It's from a PDF on Drax Discord. I'm not surprised. I said, Drax sent it to me. <laughs> I sent him a note saying I was doing this class and I couldn't find a decent picture of them next to the Tekkenhof. And he went, give me five minutes. But they are cute ships. What's really funny is none of them are built and none of them are really started because they are planned from 1913 onwards. But the chief of the, of the Austrian Hungarian Navy house at the time, he doesn't want to preempt any budget negotiations. He wants to do it properly. So he's waiting for the internal politics to agree and support them. Trouble is, by the time the internal politics agrees and supports their construction, World War I has broken out. Vision, you should get a standing desk like Churchill. It's good for body and mind. I'm not sure. I'm going to put my normal desk in here. I intended to get a standing desk at some point, but you know. Not anytime soon. Although it would allow more space in here. Hmm. I have enough fun with the tables at National Archives where you can press a button and they raise up and down electronically. So you have great fun with them and the documents on them. You can go and bring the document all up to your level and go. I'm looking really closely and go down and you can look it in full detail and go all everything. It's a lot of fun. And then I wonder when my girlfriend doesn't come to the archives with me. Hmm. I think why. Um, K class submarine should be interesting, and Minotaur class cruisers. So now onto South America, and that's a fun place to spend the next half hour, and then we're going to go back through and go through any questions you have. So, South America. Here is what starts half the fun, the main S class. This petrifies the Americans. I mean, for a while, Brazil is considered the second most powerful navy in the world. Because literally it's Britain and Brazil which have battleships. Which are dreadnoughts. Yes. It's Britain. It's Brazil. It's Britain. It's Brazil. It's the BBs coming up for you. It's the BBs coming for you. Yes. It's Britain and Brazil. Now, they're also, if you think about it, both BRs. 
But that would mean it was British Rail Squared coming for you, and no one would be scared of that. So that's why I cut stuck to the BBs, because that also means Battleship. BB. So, um... Although that'll probably get me Disney coming after me, because I'll be start talking about BB-8. Um, let's see. Minus Gareth and Sao Paulo. 12 six inch guns. Uh, tw no, 12 12 inch guns. So many six inch guns. So many guns in every single way of the imagination. Um, top speed 21 knots. Armament 22 4.7 inch guns. All sorts of things. These are just walking, talking. We're going to blow everything that gets in our way up. Um, excuse me, are you worried about us? If you attack from front or back, you can have eight guns pointing at you. If you f attack from the side, well, you've got a wing turret which can point to you. So you've got... <sighs> 10 guns which can focus on you. Now, here is the thing. Brazil is one of the few nations I know which actually makes the wing turrets make sense because they expect, for especially fighting in places like the River Plate, etc., that they could well find a battleship, engage them from a different angle, if they found themselves in a contest with, let's say, two or more powers. They could be fighting barely with one fleet, and then another fleet turn up from another side. So having guns which were not uh, were unengaged and therefore free to cover the unengaged side actually sort of makes sense if you're Brazil. Yes, they're slow, but they don't need to be fast. There are exactly two places in Brazil that anyone would want to send a navy to fight against at this point. And yeah, the battleships will be there. That's good. That would be an interesting naval alliance. The Atlantic would be securely held by the British Brazilian naval alliance. Yes. And the Jane Peter. Glad you're back. <laughs> That's really oh look a table zoom function. Those are very fun. They are. Yeah, but super firing turrets cannot shoot straight ahead or astern. Mm, it depends how they're designed. Uh, Anathenton, was it Machismo, or did they have a strategic rationale? They actually had a strategic rationale. Honestly, if you consider the sheer amount of trade that Brazil was doing with the world and the money they had, they were worried about a second-rate power like, I don't know, Spain turning up, or Argentina, or any of their other neighbors turning up and trying to take out of things. South America has a lot of bitter wars going on. A lot of bitter wars. And a lot of skirmishes going on. This thing... The, the amount of unofficial actions... See, the thing is, you go through wars. No, no, no. Unofficial actions. Well, <laughs> in this year, she fired several hundred rounds, not in an... And, oh, that turns up with damage. Oh, oh. Two dreadnoughts do not a navy make? No, but the Brazilian navy was fairly strong. It had pre-dreadnoughts and all sorts of other things as well. Why would anyone want to shout Montevideo? Uruguayans are lovely people. They're stubborn, but they're lovely. That's a Buenos Aires. The people are lovely. The governments tend to be slightly insane. Sorry about that. And that's not meant in the derogatory mental health way. That's meant in the Argentinian governments tend to be one of three things. Uh, obsessed with delivering grandiose visions, 
obsessed with making money for themselves or obsessed with well basically having relations with everything of any gender going um they're fun that's not gonna get me make me that popular in argentina is it but yeah. said people are great the governments are the ones that are interesting, especially at this time in the 1920s and 1930s. Jimmy, the two dreadnoughts do not even make. Uh, well, two out of six in the world at the time, as Galvin says, it does make them kind of powerful at the time. And you have to remember. Everyone thought, everyone believed that these ships were being built for someone else. No one could believe that these were being built for the Brazilian Navy. And the Brazilian Navy took them, manned them, and used them very well. That was good. Lovely people with a government that have limited their grasp on the limits of reality would seem to be a decent description of South America in general. Unfortunately, it's often a good description of many governments in the world in general. I can't even include Norway in the list of governments which are normally sane, because of course there is that huge aberration that is 1939 to 1940. So, displacement. Roughly 19, uh, well, roughly 19,300 tons. Uh, uh, in normal and 21,200 tons at full load. Um, they have nine inch, they have very interesting armored belt because as you can see, it's nine inch at one point, six inch at another, and then four inch at another. Um, they have a lot of firepower, and they are able to use it, broadly speaking. Broadly speaking, he says, 18 Babcock and Wilcox boilers to supply two Vickers vertical triple expansion engines, deploying 23,500 shaft horsepower over two shafts for a top speed of 21 knots. The thing is, interesting enough, is that I would argue the Brazilian battleships have more an impact on American battleship construction than the British battleships or the Anglo-German naval race. Simply speaking, American uh, were, governments were quite happy to ignore the whole dreadnought. Senators when in the United States Senate were quite happy to pretend that the dreadnought hadn't happened and they didn't have to fund them. And then Brazil has a better navy than we do? Yes. In Argentina, Chile, and Brazil have more ordered. Brazil has a better navy than we do? Yes. Calm down, Senator, your blood pressure. Brazil? Senator, blood pressure. Brazil? Sorry. Um, there were a few senators who apparently went into small apoplectic fits because everyone was so comforted by the idea that these were really being built for a Western Navy. It was going to be really, it was for the Portuguese or the Spanish or the Ottomans or the Canadians or there were some rumors there for the Australians secretly ordering them so they could break free from Britain. And they were being ordered by the Brazilians as to cover. There were so many different ideas of who was ordering them. As if the Australians would have just ordered two if they were going to secretly break free from Britain. 
<sighs> There's Rosa, like, you're British, you'll never be popular. I know. Here we go. I find a Brazilian smaller than both Chile and Argentina, except for the two drones. Fewer crews and destroyers, only two coast defense ships. That's because Chile and Argentina are in many ways building against each other, because they keep fighting. And the Brazilians are only building enough because they tend to pile in with the Chileans. But the Brazilians are building enough to beat up other people. Yeah, so Paul and Menace Grace spent their careers putting down mutinies, including each other. It's fun to have muni. Seriously, if we've been talking about munis, we could have talked about the Spanish ones. They basically murdered their entire officers at several different points. That's good. Instead of the Monroe Doctrine, we could have had the Santos Doctrine. <laughs> Yeah, better. The ship's not navy. The Great White Fleet would have murdered the Brazilian navy. Eh, maybe not. Yeah, I would watch an Australian-made farce about on board of them to break free of empire. Yeah, they, they, they that would be so Australian, but they wouldn't. And then we have. The Argentinian entry into it. The River Devia class. River Devia and Monroe. Marina. Oh, they're so cute. Now, if anyone's noticed, if you're a destroyer attack from behind, you'll have either a, you'll basically be able to be engaged by a single four inch gun. Um, these ships, not possibly the most, the best laid out. Let's be honest, let's go back to this one. Uh, yeah, you're gonna have a lot of 4.7s facing you no matter where you're coming from on this sort of ship. This one, I'm a destroyer captain. I can basically be shot at by one gun. I'm coming up from behind. <sighs> Yeah, uh, Jeff in no, not pre World War One. They weren't worried about them being built for Japan. Remember, this is pre World War One. This is when America and Japan are still actually being friendly. It's only during the massive growth of Japan during World War Two, uh, just the uh, during World War Two, World War One, and before uh, uh, in sort of the into nineteen twenties that America and Japan really start to hate each other. These were built by the Americans. Hence, they have the American Star Mars. That is the advantage they have. They do have cross deck firing. So, technically, they have a broadside which is two guns stronger. However, I would point this. If the forward. Starboard pair fires cross deck. You're going to lose your six inch guns on the port side, at least two of them, possibly three. They are interesting ships. Um, 18 Babcock and Wilcox spoilers, again, British made. Uh, free Curtis, that's American made, geared turbines. To deploy, not do deploy, 40,000 shaft horsepower via free shafts. For a top speed of 22 and a half knots. So, for all that effort, 
They managed to get one and a half knots more. What is the structure of midships? Well, this is the interesting thing. That's like oh, my notes again. I did note that down the River Devia class. E Dicum I am honestly not sure what that structure is for. I keep there are various things which come up as options. And I think it was an observation post of some sort and for their radars and uh, for their well their radios, not radars, but um honestly not sure. It's not funnels, because they have the two main stacks, and that's what they have in there. They have control towers. Hmm. Anyone has any suggestions what that middle structure is about? I do not know. Again, I don't think it's funnels. I don't think... Honestly, there is... Someone wanted to have a rugby field goal in the middle? I do not know. I honestly, there is part of... I, I have been looking at books. I have been looking everywhere. And in my notes, I just have a, a load of question marks, actually. I was hoping I had that. I just don't know. It's it's one of those strange things. Crane mounts for the boats. I suppose it's potentially potential. Spotlight mounts, well, possibly. I just no. Yeah. Boat cranes. Is, boat cranes is possibly the uh, the best thing they could be. Maybe air intakes to the boiler rooms. Possibly, but normally you'd have those in the stacks unless you had some really weird arrangement going on down there. Stop guards to the wing tires and stop them shooting each other. That would work. Big bone cranes, could be. Cranes for loading coal. It, potentially, there is lots of good things with cranes going on there, I think. Crane mounts and search mounts. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. No boat show, no means of escape. Well, let's look at this picture. Um... This is the thing is actually built, and you'll notice that it again doesn't look like the planned structure at all. Well, it could do, but that doesn't look like a crane to me. 
again, I it doesn't also look like an air intake. Running cash, pretty sure they're cranes. They could be cranes, but they don't look like it from this angle unless their jib comes up. Hmm. That's taken during her speed trials. Seen it, Aeon Cash. Pretty sure they're crazy. Seen it some before, unless I'm having ugly shit nightmares. That might be it. Uh, great starting. In on the more detailed versions of the plans, there are boats in the opposite move. So maybe they are boat cranes, but again, that looks like I have no idea. America built them. For Argentina. I just. Hmm. I'll go find one. I'll find another one and see if I can have a look at it. Yeah, I think they're cranes. I found another photo. Although. I will, as I will show. Yeah, that looks, um, That's a rather interesting crane, if that is a crane. That's a very interesting structure to have on them. Okay, did everyone else spend the last few minutes on their noses pressed or awkward against the screen? Trust me, I'm just currently wishing I'm sitting here with, um, I have my eyes on a very big screen for my PC when I finally get down here and when I can finally have the spare money to get it. And so I can zoom in a lot. And, uh, yeah. Dear Scott, they're probably a combination of all the above. Heavily built cranes that also serve as turret swaps to platform with platforms of searchlights and light guns. Possibly. Front of that ship looks like the USS Michigan. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, 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 I know I shouldn't be doing this and shouldn't be judging ships by their looks, but... That's... Take this one back and go to this one. But it just looks prettier to me. The minus to go to S class just looks prettier. That I, I might be biased because one's British style, one's American style, dread, you know, dreadnought, but. I don't think my national bias is affecting me that much. I do think the minus GRS class looks prettier. In carriage. Thank you. NavalEncyclopedia.com says they are gooseneck cranes for boat. Okay. Jeffrey, Prince Ayasodotogua and Baron Elchish Shibasra. 
Only after passing in 1940, these two Japanese diplomats were the militants able to pressure Japan into joining the Axis powers in World War II. Man, pretty much. They'd signed the Comintern back a bit earlier than that, but you know. And they have been fighting Russia at one point. Thanks, that squad. Yeah. All right, they're cranes. Still ugly. I'm sorry, it's ugly. Okay. This one's pretty dope. Thankfully, got back to one. This is Almirante La Torre. Now, Almirante La Torre is, of course, otherwise known as Canada. And Cochrane, of course, becomes HMS Eagle and is kept in the Royal Navy. Um, which is rather un not unusual for Britain uh, for a Cochrane. Uh, it often started off going to a foreign, uh, often started off wandering between various navies. But La Torre was, of course, the Chilean vice admiral and one of the principal actors of the War of the Pacific and hero of the Battle of Agmos. So keeping him was perfectly good. Interesting thing about the La Torre. The Americans actually tried to pressure the Chileans to sell her to them at, after they lost all their ships in Pearl Harbor because she'd been upgraded during the interwar period. She'd had a full upgrade in the beginning of the 1930s. Um, she had her upgrade in 1931, uh, you know, sent to the United Kingdom for modernization in 1929, two years, and then it goes into, arrives back in Chile. They then put her into reserve from 1933 onwards, only a caretaker patrol, uh, crew. So this is a practically a freshly remodeled ship, which has its engine still in perfect condition after they've had a major upgrade, all the things all done. Um, it's a useful ship. And Americans go, we'd like this ship, which you can understand. It's a useful ship, especially if you compare it to some of the standards. It is 28,600 tons and uh, standard, um, 32,120 uh, 32, tons in full. It's um, coal and oil fired Yarrow boilers with a low pressured Parsons and a high pressured brown curtains Parsons steam turbines, capable of 22.75 knots, range of 4,400 nautical miles at 10 knots, um, which was upgraded, uh, 10 14 inch guns, 16 6 inch guns, some three inch guns, some three pounder guns, and uh, she's a very, very good ship. She's part of the Chilean, um, Chilean sort of Argentinian naval race, and she's preceded in service by the Capitan Pratt, which is a very interesting little ship if you want to look it up. It's definitely not on the Dreadnought, so that's why it's on tonight. But um, it is a very interesting ship and a very successful one in some regards.
Alrighty. So. Shomak, define pressure. Uh, basically, the um, American ambassador was turning up in the president's palace with a blank checkbook and very heavily hinting that if they didn't, the Americans would be very upset, very insulted, and very, very distressed. Um, there was also an American... Uh, there were some plans, apparently, for an American cruiser to come and board it and all sorts of things. The Americans end up backing up because the Chileans basically deploy a full crew to the ship and go, she will be now fully crewed and fully worked up. And she spends most of the rest of the war patrolling her area and making sure no one comes into South America. And the Americans decide actually that's quite useful because if there's a 40, uh, if there's a um, battleship going around with her guns in that area, that means that no real surface raiders from Japan or Germany are going to get through past Chile. Because anything that turns up is going to be a single ship and it ain't going to want to fight that thing. Maybe 16 and 14. It would have done good to sell it to the US, I suspect. Mm. The US could have used that, but they'd have spent a lot of time refueling her. In car, so Amateur Latour, Canada, and HS Eagle are hulls are basically the same. Pretty much, yes. Coal and oil fired. Yes, Melanie. Any post refits pictures? I'm guessing look like repulse. Um, I think that is a post refit picture. I'm not sure. I think that is a post refit picture. Animal 16365, British 14 inch guns and American 14 inch guns. Could they both fire each other's ammunition for their 14 inch guns? Similar enough. It wouldn't be fun, but similar enough. Maybe the Chile could have had two Invincibles too. Would they be worth it? What about the Carry Eagle too? If they'd had two Invincibles, La Torre and Eagle as a carrier, so that being Cochrane, they'd taken the Carrier Eagle rather than La Torre, uh, they'd have had a very interesting navy. They'd have certainly had a very capable little force for the South America. You'd have probably seen another arms race going on in South America, which could mean helpful for Britain, especially because it could have allowed them to keep building battleships because that's the half the problem for Britain is it's not just the, the Washington treaties and the naval treaties don't just stop Britain building ships they seem to stop everyone else really building ships because no one feels they need to it's annoying it would have kept British industry going quite happily if you had had people building ships in British yards Hmm. Come on. Basically, it might not sink it, but it would do a mission kill. You would be, a mission kill will be made by trying to avoid it. If you actually caught, uh, got found by it, then you can have problems. Uh, Alan, did they get a discounted price due to the excess mileage? Not as much as you'd hope. Let's go. Wait. You're going to crew her and sail around the world to do what we would have done and we don't have to pay for the crew? Awesome. Yeah. Why do you think Chile features on the Lend Lease supplies? They ain't no fools. How does coal and oil fire work? Some boilers use one fuel while others use the other. Also, what about bunkerage? Now, here's the interesting thing. In some ships, you would be talking coal and oil fired because they'd be using have coal fired and oil fired. Some ships like this one, if I understand it correct from what I've been reading, 
have coal and then they have oil sprayers so you have coal fire and then you spray oil into the fire which the coal is making and that superheats it up and makes it really really energetic and really heavy flame which gives you really good steam and lets you go really really fast but it's also a good way to ruin your furnaces and your boilers which is why ships which have it tend to have to be reconditioned a little bit more often than the ones which are plain oil or plain coal. But it's a really good idea for a nation which is sometimes rich in coal, sometimes rich in oil, sometimes rich in neither, sometimes rich in both. Because you don't have to do any conversion. Vision. In the last PV, the US ambassador to Chile saw was the Oregon in 1989. A smelly person who ate onions, we said. Oh, no. Animal 16365. Did any Navy try using cannon stokers on a ship that's coal fired? Pretty much every Navy in the 1920s and 30s tries that idea out to see if that w could work to change for oil, but in the end they go with oil. Carmen, what's for dinner tonight? Um, muffins. I had quite a big lunch. Right. So, before I disappear off, well, not disappear off, but before I start going through all them to ask questions, I'm going to produce another ship and talk about her because I want to talk about her, but I want to talk about it in a very specific way. Ba 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 bing ding. Yep, this is Arjunkor. Isn't she pretty? Do you think she has enough guns? Because that's really what I'm worried about. And here's the thing. Yes, originally she's being built by the Brazilians and then sold to the Ottomans and then compulsory purchased by the Brits. But that's not because the Brazilians are really getting out of the race. No, no, no. They've just decided that what they need isn't more guns, but bigger guns. Yes, what we need isn't more guns, but bigger guns. Bigger, bigger guns. We really need more and bigger guns. Which is where they get the rear shallow from. Now, the rear shallow was to be 10, 15 inch or 8, 16 inch um, with up to 25 knot speed. Um, using oil, displacements up to 30,000 tons. But they chose in the end one with eight 15 inch design uh, guns, which looked like somewhat a modif uh, and half a uh, halfway place between Queen Elizabeth and Revenge class, uh, Revenge classes. And um, it was to be aimed by uh, the named Rio Shello, and it was ordered from Armstrong Whitworth Shipyard in Ellswick in 1914 on the 12th of May. The materials have been gathered and the uh, keel laying planned for the 10th of September. But First World War, of course, was declared in August and that delayed plans and Rio Shadow was officially suspended in, 1915 and in January 1915 and cancelled in May 1915. This was to be the third of... Mm, uh, their dreadnoughts and they were then after that planning a fourth which was um 
possibly still out to tender till 1922. So honestly, the Brazilians wanted battleships. They wanted them bad. They'd had the taste of being what was in the papers called in America, the second most powerful Navy in the world. And they wanted it. They wanted it so bad. They wanted to be big and powerful. So everyone trembled when they heard the Brazilians were turning up and not just the Brazilian soccer team or football team, the Brazilian Navy's turning up. Oh, so powerful. That's good. I was wrong about the cranes on over there. They are just next to structures. The structures just seem to be mainly there to put platforms on for various bits of kit. Or as gun blockers. I think that's what they really are. That's what part of them is there for. Stop the guns firing at each other. And uh, Jeff Hiller, Chile got La Torre and her destroyers for free, plus cash after World War One. The cash was needed more than the Invincibles and Eagle. Hmm, yes. Uh, enough for prestige combined with armor cruisers. Yeah, I would argue that, but you know, it would have been fun to have more. Vision, does your office have heat or AC? It has heat. Air conditioning is opening a window, which is going to be fun in summer for people with me doing the lives out here. I don't think the coal dust is explosive. Ergo problems with mechanical coal fields. E coal fields. E yes. That and, you know, other little issues. Basically, someone decided if you had enough 12 inch guns, you could make it look like it was a machine gun firing. And there aren't many which are going to want to take that on. She does have a very big boat crane. A very, very big boat crane. Did Fisher know about design? Did he react? He did know about it and he possibly cried at the beauty of it. Come, what does the uh, why does the uh, what does the RN name so many issues after towns are something being cancelled? It works, doesn't it? Eating suffered. A bigger boat crane than Argentina's. Definitely a bigger boat crane than Argentina's. Vision. When you're crossing the Pacific, you have to take your time to save fuel. Hence, 20 knot battle line compared to the faster British ships in the North Sea. Um, yes, but the British battleships, remember, aren't. Just... Okay, so here is the thing the British can cross the world and afford to be faster because they have more coaling places to go to on the way and fewer places to stop at on the way. The Americans don't, which is why they need to find a way to increase their range somehow, hence they go slower. It's fine. They are fun ships, though. All right. The largest Union Pacific steam engines had mechanical coal build feed. Mm. Coal dust is explosive in large enough quantities, but it also burns really well. Coal power plants tend to use coal ground into dust to burn very efficiently. Did navies do the same? Uh, by the time we start to get that tech, navies have found oil power. 
And oil has an advantage over coal. You don't need to coal ship, which means you can reduce the crew somewhat significantly. You can give the individual crew a lot more space. Also, you can move the oil around and cover it far more efficiently. Coal is very inefficient space-wise on a warship. On any ship, really. I don't think, well, to be honest, to me, I, I always consider this sort of like someone took a early version of the Nelson class and had an accident with HMS Dreadnought. Come on, what do you think will be the next fuel for a ship? They're looking at a lot of options. But at the moment, I don't think anyone's really pushing anything. It'll come when it's got a lot more efficient in, industry, in civilian industry. But I think the next interesting thing will be when you try and electrify army vehicles, because I think you'll do that before you electrify ships. And sort of possibly make them sort of try and make military vehicles. More like, um, well, various forms of Tesla. King Carl, you want one? Do any RN dreadnoughts get any uh, any further than the Gallipoli? Uh, I appreciate battle cruisers travel more widely. HMS Air Australia, of course, gets as far as the far, uh, spends a lot of time in the Far East. Um, so does New Zealand visit out there. Of course, a couple get down to the Falklands. Mm. The battleships don't really get deployed, but they don't need to deploy them. This is the thing. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of like World War II. Think about it. Where did the battleships get deployed? Did they go to the South Atlantic? Not really. There's a battle cruiser rushing down there, but that's when Grass Bay's down there. When she sunk, returns home. Um, is there need for battleships in the West Atlantic? Not really. They don't really get out there unless they have to. Where are battleships needed? They're needed to cover the Arctic convoys. They're needed to cover the... <sighs> the entrance is the North Sea and the blockade and the channel. They're needed to fight in the Mediterranean. They're needed in the Eastern and so later the Pacific fleet. That's where the British send them. Where did the Americans send their battleships? Well, there's a fair number turn up for D-Day and some for turn up for Torch and things like that. But the vast majority are chucked into the Pacific because that's what they need to be. And even then, they're not wandering around vast ways of the Pacific on their own going, Hello, do you need a battleship? They're usually in packs hunting or fighting. Sometimes with the enemy. I think if we're getting to warp drive, I think that's when we got our spaceships. Well, no. Cute. Definitely cute. Right now. So. Okay, second tier powers dreadnought designs. 
Well, I wasn't too keen, I have to admit, on part of the title, because second tier tends to sort of always immediately people start thinking second rate or second, as in low quality. That's certainly not the thing with these ships. They are not low quality in any way stretch of the imagination. They're good ships. I would say there's a definite difference between the ships built by other nations for them and ships built by nations. In that uh, I would say the ships which are more innovative tend to be the ones built by the powers themselves. If they're getting something built for them, they want it reliable. They're spending a lot of money and they're not and they're not risking it in their own country. Um definitely the post World War One, some British patrol not so cruising the Black Sea. Yes, post World War One. Not during World War One. I, Amok, I don't think this big boy is 500,000 tons. I, 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 I'm just in saying that's his way, that's 17,000 or 15,000 tons. I don't think the big boy is bigger than the Espana class. Don't think, don't think so. Animal 16 foot 365. Fusion power will not have them. There's too many issues that prevent its use. To our current understanding of technology. I never say ne something will never happen because who knows what technology we'll find out at the end. So that's awesome. I understand your point on repairing military equipment. Sad though, for me at least. Or hail the mighty V8. Mm, yeah. I think the electric the interesting thing about electric power will of course reduce the thermal image of tank L vehicles. So that's where I think it'll be coming in. They'll be going, ooh, thermal. Jane Peter, so this thing could take out a Congo, right? Mmm, potentially. The Spania class could... The Spania class couldn't do anything. The Spaniard class would make the Japanese have to send the Congo. Um, that could take out a Congo. The Erzat Monarch class could take out a Congo. Uh, Bellafron and Temeraire go to the Med late in World War I. Yeah. Uh, lots of things appear in the med late in World War One because, well, they're still worried about various other certain ships beginning with G actually managing to do something. Especially after they escape and beat up a monitor. That's good. 500 pounds and pounds seems more reasonable. Oh, pounds. Pounds does seem more reasonable. Um, in car, does UK or USA place restriction naval technology export in World War One? Um, no, they really don't. They're really not placing because half the stuff when there's a nice way which you're building pays for the development costs of their stuff. In uh, uh, vision boat crane man, I'm still I still think those are weird structures to have in the middle of your ship, and they they might be used for all sorts of legitimate reasons to have them, especially considering you have the, you have those double turrets there, but it's still weird. Adam Flynn, the Spanner class had a sunny disposition, winning personality. No. With what happened to them, no. I think at least two of them. Let me just an example. I think uh, both Espana and Jamie the first managed to massacre their officers at some different various points. I'm gonna check this one out. Espana. Bayamba Bararara Espana.
And I am being reminded to mention Super Chats. Thank you very much to everyone who ever does them. They're all very nice and they go towards my takeaways mainly. Well, no, actually they go towards the books. Like, patron money goes towards the books. And if you do like the videos, please like them. If you feel like watching more, please subscribe. Maybe you can press the little bell down there. Thank you. And thank you to the person who reminded me. Right in. Espana class. Da -da 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 Now, um, yeah, Espana was in Feral, which um, how she was in use primarily as a barrack ship. Her commander was Lieutenant Commander Gabriel Rosas. And he ordered a landing party to go ashore, though he refused to explain his intentions, prompting elements of the crew to murder him and several officers. They then went ashore to assist the Republican forces attempting to break into the Feral Arsenal, then held by a nationalist extremist. They were repulsed by nationalist fire and returned the ship. Some army detachments at this point, including some coastal artillery units around the harbour, sided with Franco. The destroyer of Alce Alsacia also set aside to the nationalist side. An artillery duel between the batteries and Velasco on the Nash's side and Espana and the cruiser Amarante Serva, the crew of which also decided to side with government, resulted in considerable destruction in the harbour and significant damage to Velasco. After two days of fighting, the crews of Espana and Amarante Serva reached the negotiation settled the nationalists, who gained control of the harbour, surrendering the vessels to the nationalists. They didn't have the fuel or the ability to really get away. I don't know. Yeah, it's fun. Thank you, Bijan. Thank you for watching, Kaga. Martha. <laughs> uh, that's it. Um... Cameron, what's your top three suggestions from the patron vote? I want them all. I'm not going to get in that because I'm sort of in your book. I would like them all, but I'm going to see what happens. So, how did they spend it? They massacred their own officers. They killed them all, pretty much. On Jamie's first, um basically the captain went i am siding for the republic and i'm staying loyal to the government and some of his officers decided not to and well they got kicked off permanently to the great navy in the sky um yeah personally i don't mind you spending any super chats and i am able to spend on the room thank you um uh, and you treat myself once or once a week maximum I try to be good. Do you have a Spaniards versus any two South American dreadnoughts plus each, uh, each supporting fleet? I go for the South American dreadnoughts because, and this is going to sound terrible, they they tend to be slightly better crewed and officered. The Espanias are notorious for mutinies and all sorts of issues. Yes, the Brazilians have problems and all those sort of things, but... And the Argentinians have God knows how many problems, but... The Brazilian ships, the moment there is a risk of war, they become very good and very... They sort of remind you of the 1970s Conservative Party in the UK, in that... Given half a chance, they look like they're fighting a vicious civil war. Moment there is a le general election, boom! They're as loyal and as organized as anything, and they will f work it out really, really well. Um, 
in this in this case you have these groups will argue each other non-stop the crews will be pretty much a non-stop war zone and then the moment there is there's an Argentinian battleship coming up there. Those are the, they're in place. They're going, yes, sir. Where do we fire, sir? Da, 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 da. And they're working really, they work really, really well together. Um, which could be the way the, Argen uh, the Brazilians just run their fleet. Why is that? Well, they're not officially named. So I've called them the Erzat Monarch class, and that's why I'm using them, because they were supposed to be the replacements for the monarchs. Uh, Spain and Manitoba. Wait, who killed their officers? Uh, the crew of the Espana, the last ship we just saw. Well, it was originally built as the Afonso, the F 13th, but after Afonso was kicked out to form the Second Republic of Spain, and as Espana herself had already sunk and managed to mm, damage herself, they renamed it Espana. Well, hey. Um, Abazaski, shouldn't we also be talking about the French Navy with seven dreadnoughts in World War One? I? I wouldn't call them top tier. Close to Italy, actually. Um, mainly the reason I'm avoiding the French Navy is because I like to keep a healthy distance between me and French naval design, because at many points I'm going... Eh. However, it, when this turns into a long patrol, the French Navy, the Ottomans, Greeks... Russian Navy, British Navy, and American Navy will all appear, and the German Navy as well, probably. I'll try and do videos on all of them. I might keep it to second tier. I might not. I, I might just keep it to French and Russian, because the American, British, and I I Germans, I might want to do individual video sets on, because that I want to go into them in slightly more detail. I think I need to own my chair. Doesn't I thought that ended with a bounty? No, <laughs> oh, trust me, you don't want to know half the events that happen on these things. These things were fun. At one point, there was a whole no go no go area for officers, uh, where the chiefs could go, but the officers couldn't. And the trouble is that area was under decks, under the two middle turrets. So basically, there, there was this whole section of the middle ship where the officers have to go on deck if they want to still be alive by the time they get to the aft. There's fun in these ships. And they weren't even having a civil war. When are you having a civil war? Hmm. Gahaman, the Italian fleet in 1930 versus the South American navies in 19... Who wins? Um, if they're fighting in the Atlantic, probably the South American navies, because they can actually have the range, and the Italians will run out of fuel. Uh, if they're fighting in the Mediterranean, the Italians. Because <laughs> they'll be more organized, and they do actually have some good officers and good some very good ships. And they modernize them more. Wait a minute. A civil war like does not sound like fun at all. No, civil wars are not fun. Civil wars are really, really nasty. In fact, they're the least civil war going. Um so yeah. nothing is worse than when you turn neighbor against neighbor. Sibling against sibling, parent against child, and that is what civil wars do. They are brutal. And the things that will be done in a civil war will make you really, really disturb. Uh, really, really... Hmm. And you can honestly say that some of the darker parts of Second World War are because... There are also civil wars or pseudo civil wars going on inside them. Because you could argue that genocide against a significant minority element of your population is a form of civil war where one side doesn't have any weapons. The other side has the full, uh, full abilities of the state. 
Big John. Royal Navy had a mutiny or two in the interwar years around 1930. Yes. Mainly due to some arguments about um, pay, which were poorly handled by various admirals. That's actually... As that means replacement in German. Um, general German and Aid in Austria Hungarian naming convention before being named, all ships were named as a replacement for old ship name here. Yeah. And as they were never built. Mm. Um, Paul wasn't there a British ship in the Caribbean that mutinied in World War II? Can't remember. Might have been, but can't remember. There were a few issues in World War Two when you had really, really some really stupid decisions made. Um, Jeb, the French have the Dantons and many lovely floating hotels. Oh yes. Oh, let's see. Well, French have some very creative ideas. The chat would consist of lots of why, 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 or quoting Chieftain. I don't know what they were thinking. This is why I'm going to do it as a uh, Long Patrol video. Because I have a feeling I wouldn't get through anything else if I did the included the French in this. This was the point. This I thought I could get through in roughly three and a half hours. A Canadian one voted to go home, yeah? And that was always fun. HMCS Uganda. That's called Civil Wars are notoriously uncivil and usually invariably lead to multiple civil wars until one group is left. Mm, or until someone comes in and makes sure people's in. And do something like that and don't stop it. Jopiola, the Espanians end up on opposite sides of the Spanish War. Yes, but never meet in battle, sadly enough. Could have been an interesting one. Especially as I have a feeling, um, I think Espa I, I think Jamie the first fighting for the Republic would have probably beaten Espania because Espania had managed to manage to do a lot of damage to herself. Both Espanias end up being used, and actually the original Espania um, end up being their guns end up being used to provide coastal batteries. Calvin Gans, Maria Zermonarch. Astra Hungarian decided the four ships were Monarch, Wien, Budapest, and the fourth Moon Hero. It was going to be the first pre dreadnought which was replaced. Um, the Errol is pre dreadnought after that, so I think it would have been Hyundai. Uh, Darius Rosatsky, this is why the Polish Navy used the Paris class battleship we got handed as a barrack ship. It was a hotel. Yeah. It that would make sense for it. Version too bad that none of these BBs from these nations lasted long enough to be a museum. So maybe we could be make a lovely seaside attraction. Guns pointed to Gibraltar. That wouldn't have been good for that ship to have any guns pointed at Gibraltar. The Royal Navy has a habit with Spanish ships pointing guns at Gibraltar. It's not good for them. Uh, Andrew Carroll have to say thank you very much, and I will need to catch up on the rest that I missed while at Robbie. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Uh, currently, I keep looking at. Uh, I've now got to the point where I actually have to buy um, my design, um, the battleship design. Oh, what's it? Um, Ultimate Admiral. I, I've got to actually buy it at some point. I don't know what dreadnoughts. Um. I keep put, I kept putting it off and putting it off until I have basically spare cash from the offices, but I'm going to have to buy it once I get the new computer set up. Well, not the new computer set up, the gaming machine set up. 
down here once I got a desk because I need to start being able to produce some decent graphics of ships which well for one of the classes I'm teaching about what if scenarios producing some decent graphics of mm, ships which might have been would be quite useful for me Oh my gosh, the French have rarely lasted three and a half hours before in any battle or conflict. Um, they have. So the trouble is for the French is they have a habit of killing off their experienced senior officers well, as soon as they get them, or kicking them out of the navy because they're the wrong religion. Don't go on. In the English Civil War cost lives of 10 25% of the British and Irish population. Much worse in Wessex, Wales, and Scotland. That's said about Ireland in the context is better. Yeah. American Civil War, not good. Civil Wars are not, far, are not good things. And as Jeff Hiller points out, the French did start la last longer in World War One than many other countries. They do. They did that okay in World War One, World War Two, mm, but they lost a lot in World War One. One Danton class versus one, one Radetzky class opinion. The French are suffering from a lack of. Oh. Yes, they do. You see, my heart would say the Radetskis. But the Dantons do have more guns. But I think, and, bo and both are going to have the same trouble in telling the splashes apart. So I think probably the Dantons just to not answer the car uh, and answer that, Carl. Um, one Danton versus one Radetsky. But honestly, I have a feeling... It's whichever manages to hit the other first. Uh, well, that's the thing with Stafford. The uh, um, Ultimate Admirals requires a computer, does really require a, compu a decent PC to run. It requires a lot of RAM and a lot of hard disk space and a lot of processing power to really get to work properly. So that's one of the reasons why I haven't got it at the moment because the version I've been running on the laptop is very, very slow and very, very, um, it doesn't like me running it on the laptop. Like World of Warships is not too keen on me running it on the laptop. So PC will be got down and PC will be slowly upgraded. Because it's been sitting up in the loft for about 18, you know, 18 months would be about 12 months, 14 months. Yeah. Surely the older BA CAD CAM stuff is now sort of available. They did renderings. Yes and no. It's sort of available, but doesn't. 
this is going to sound strange, but modern students have a certain requirement in terms of the of the drawings they see, and actually, unfortunately, the older CAD CAM doesn't fit that requirement, and you get complaints, and they go, oh, but, 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 but there's too many lines, and you go, okay, fine, let me find something better. World of, this is how I ended up starting playing World of Warships. Literally, because I was hunting for ship designs I could use. Print screen. Boom. World of Warships is slightly cruel to Austria Hungarian ships. Tom Golding. Planning a naval war game, and now things are on the way. Uh, World War II British battle cruiser equivalent, backed by a tribal flotilla and some other destroyers against the Roma. Two World War One destroyer knots and nine destroyers. Whew. That'd be fun. That'd be the best second tier design given the needs of his country. That would have been good if it had been built. That would have been very good if it had been built. That was pretty good for Spain, but yeah, I'm gonna go down there, draw a class. They're just pretty. And they are probably the best for, uh, best for Italy. And it's a design. I said, that's the question. That's designed that suits the needs of the nation. Anna Flynn, Danton versus Rodetsky, which moon is first? Oh, well, probably the Danton, because uh, whilst Rodetsky goes because of the mixed nationality crews, the thing is, the mixed nationality crews, it would take a while to work out they're actually mutinying. So they might start mutinying first, but they might not realize they're mutinying till after the Danton is already mutinied. And there's always the possibility that they don't mutiny, and the nicest way, the hatred for the French overrides their mutinying. Whereas the French, you'd have to rely on the French hatred of the French being outweighed by their hatred of the Austro-Hungarians. Tom Golding, up against the uh, Mrs. who's Irish, so I assume I'll lose on dice rolls. Probably, but remember, also, please do remember that it's St. Patrick's Day not that long ago. She could still have a lot of luck going. Jane Peter, did the admirals back then ever choose their flagship based on what looked sexist as opposed to what was appropriately? Um, BT was obsessed with the newest, fastest thing, and you then have Jellico who likes to go for Operation Inappropriate. Do they still? They choose what's available. In the Royal Navy, their pretty much options are Bulwark class or Type 45s, technically have space for an Admon staff, and Queen Elizabeth class. I'll be in a Bulwark, you're probably going to have to share the load of booty, so you'll probably be the um, Commodore Amphibious Warfare, of whatever they're calling that now. Um. If you're on an aircraft carrier on the Queen Elizabeth class, the great thing is you can stick the RAF off in their own island and keep them well away from you. So you can pretend you're an admiral in World War II on an aircraft carrier. Well, hey. Captain's Evil, putting a Danton in, a torpedo in a Danton's wine store would be big enough to trigger a mutiny. I think if I remember correctly, the wine store was pretty well protected. And I bet competition is stiff to get on the carriers. Hmm, yeah. 
Vision, what would an Irish BB look like? Uh, what would be the strategy behind the sign? Would they buy American? Mm. They'd probably be buying a coastal battleship, a coast defense battleship. Um, and if they're buying instead of having forts, would they buy American? Probably not, actually. They'd probably buy British. And the reason I say that is because they're still technically part of the British Empire. Yes, they're independent, but there's a level of independence they've not yet got. They keep pushing for more independence and getting further independent. But you have to remember, there was that point when I was talking about the Britain in 1936 treaty, how they push for more independence post um, Edward VIII. Um, so, yeah, I think, not recently, it's not over the accident. I am say getting confused. Uh, but the thing is, the Irish wouldn't be building a battleship till post World War One. So it'd be after World War One, but prior to 19, for, um, the sort of 1920s to 1930s. So if they're building it, you're building in a scenario probably where the, uh, where the Washington Naval Treaty is significantly laxer and which case <sighs> i suppose you could build a version of the nelson class which is a coastal defense ship because honestly you'd think we presume they'd probably go with whatever design the british are churning out Admiral House led the bombardment on Canada on behalf on one of the oldest pre-dreadnoughts in the as lead ship. If it catches a mine. Yeah, but that's Admiral House. He's a very interesting admiral. Tom Garning, with the best will in the world, in the world why did Spain either draw not post uh, Spanish American Civil uh, American War? Because of the Spanish American War, America wiped out their navy. They felt they had been robbed. They'd been wronged. They had all their manhoods removed. They were no more a power in the world because of these cruel Americans, these upstart Americans. So they went crying to the British and they said, we must build something, we must build our navy. And the British went, how much are you willing to pay? Yeah, consultancy fee, thank you, rest, we'll help you build them. The British were never stupid when it came to getting money. Um, the US Air Force chooses the YF-22 over the YF-23 because the former looked more like an F-15. The YF-23 was half Mach faster, had a supersonic turn, and 60 um, dB all a better all-round self. Hmm. But they didn't look as cool. No, no, Roland. Right, it's almost 10 o'clock. I've got to help, go help pack up. So I will say thank you to everyone watching. As ever, I will answer the last questions, but I will say thank you. I will also say thank you for all the super chats. Very kind of you. I'll say thank you for all the likes. Please do like if you like. Please subscribe if you want to watch more. Um, there is also a little bell down there, which if you press, you should get an alert when I go live or when I put up a little video. And uh, there should be some commentary quick answer videos coming soon. And thank you again to everyone who's on Patreon, uh, who's supporting my very, very excessive but lovely book habit. And um, thank you to everyone who's on Discord chatting away. I was asking, in Poland, you tried to find a ship that's still able to leave the port. That's your flagship. Yeah. Come on, let's see for one, The Jean Bart's wine, Corbet class, wasn't well protected against anti 
and, and uh, Austro Hungarian Whitehead torpedoes. It wasn't. That was what they learned that one, but some of them they had better protected. I'm going if I was Irish in every command, I'd want plenty of submarines, e boats, and gun torpedo boats. Anything larger, and I'd honestly fancy a lower spec Adrian's hood. Hmm. You'd fancy it, but what would be the point of it? Maj uh, vision. Would three majestic class battleships for Spain who won the war in 1898? Um, they wouldn't have certainly been in a bad position if they'd had them. They might have actually been better off, especially if they could have found, I don't know, some British crews to man them, so they didn't constantly have people de wanting to have philosophical debates rather than fight a war. No, the crews were pretty darn good. It was some of the officers of the class, which were a bit interesting in the Spanish ships. Take care, everyone. Take care, Stafford. Thank you, DG40. Thank you, Darius Russo. Thank you, Jane Peter. Thank you, Paul Chicago. Did he say anything about Vickers in Spain? Vickers basically were building the entire Spanish armed force at one point. Everything was Vickers. It was kind of like BAE, but foreign and still supplying air and actually still supplying everything um take care paul johnson frank Kilsack, thank you thank you everyone right then so bum that was there thank you thank you trent talenko thank you cahedron Thank you, Awazaski. Thank you, Calvin Gasberg. Thank you, Bijan. Thank you, DG40. Thank you, Jamie Peter. Thank you, Anouk. Thank you, Frank Cusack. Thank you, Paul Johnson. Paul from Chicago. Thank you. Basically, have a nice evening, Melly1640. Thank you. Jess P. Thank you, Mentai Slavic. Thank you, Tom Golding. Thank you, Captain Seafort. Thank you. Anouk, I think I said thank you. Thank you, but if I haven't, thank you. And basically, thank you, everyone. I hope you've had a nice evening. I hope you've enjoyed. God, it's amazing to think the Church of England was so militant in the 30s. Oh, the Church of England. Militant was nothing compared to what they were in the 30s. They were a special, special group. Um, again, I offer access to my Hungarian sources of long patrol. I might well ask you, if you could, or rather, in the nicest way, if you could belt me some interesting stories in English which you think might be interesting for them, for each of the ships. I'm happy to add those into it and talk about the individual ships because I think that stuff is kind of nice to have in there. And thank you, Greg Sarsky. Thank you, everyone, and have a good evening. Thank you. Take care and thank you. Thank you, Han Maxi. Thank you. <laughs>